Returning now to council. Uh, Tony, I'll ask if you could please call the roll. Menes? Yes, present. Corrales? Aye. Or I'm sorry, I'm here. That's fine. Diep? Also here. All you have to do is make a noise. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Here. here. Esparza? <laughs> that was a noise. Yeah. Esparza? Uh, Reynas? Foley? Here. Camus? Hill? Yes, here. Uh, Jones? Present. Ricardo? Present. Do you have a quorum? Hi, this is Maya. I'm here. Okay. Councilmember Sparsa is present. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, appreciate all the members of the community came out to speak, uh, many of whom have been deeply engaged in this issue for some time. And um, and really, we got here in part because the community pushed hard, um, pushed us, and the community was also will be willing to be pushed. And by that, I mean there's a lot of folks uh, who have very settled expectations and the way they're building buildings and uh, the way they're developing and um, everything from card chargers to, um, to, to gas design and so forth, it's required a lot of shifting. And I appreciate that we have a community that's nimble enough to recognize the imperative of uh, the need to move forward. And so uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for your push. I know we don't agree on everything. Uh, that's, it's never been the case, I think, that everyone agrees on everything about how we move forward in difficult, complex issues like this. Um, but fundamentally, I do believe everyone on all sides is trying to get to the right result, which is see how we can get to a zero emissions future. And that zero emission future certainly needs to be a responsible one. And part of it being responsible, I believe, also enables or requires us to have energy sources that are resilient and reliable. Uh, right now, we don't have that. And we're pushing everybody toward an electric grid that is anything but reliable. And I don't need to remind this council, I know, about the near daily episodes we had throughout the summer and fall of news about everything from wildfires to power safety shutoffs to ISO directives to, to impose brownouts to save on peak energy um, or reduce peak energy flows. Uh, to simple failures as we had, for example, in our downtown uh, on a pg and &E substation that uh, on a particularly hot day, just transformer failed uh, and we had thousands of residents who were without electricity. And we've been putting up with that. We've been tolerating it, uh, perhaps not happily, but we've been tolerating it. And it's certainly a nuisance uh, to say the least, uh, but for some, it's a lot more than that. And we know if you're operating a facility where people are dependent on being on respirators, for example, uh, seniors, uh, that's a life or death situation. You need to have backup power. Similarly, hospitals, data centers, a lot of other folks find it pretty darn essential that they have really reliable power. Uh, and we don't have that with the electric grid today. And so before we decide we're pushing everybody to a grid that's not terribly reliable, we ought to make sure that we have our own backup. <laughs> that is, that we enable those who are truly sensitive to resilience issues, very sensitive to uh, interruptions of power, to be able to have viable solutions. And for some time, that solution has been a diesel backup. And that certainly works in many contexts. I think I don't need to tell the council or the public who are very well trained in the challenges of diesel. Um, it's not just greenhouse gas emissions. It's uh, nitrous oxides, it's sulfur oxides, it's the particulates, 2.5 PM, that is particularly devastating. And those who are well-versed in issues of environmental justice know well uh, what neighborhoods are most subjected to those kinds of particulates and those pollutants and what children suffer and which ones don't. And so uh, there's no question in my mind uh, that if we just had the contest simply on which approach is going to have lower GHG emissions in any given year? There's no question that San Jose clean energy supplied electric grid with 
a occasionally sparsely used um, diesel backup will win the day simply on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the problem is that it's much more complex than that. And what we have is uh, what some folks call an optimization problem. We have to optimize both reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and resilience and reliability for those who are, again, really sensitive to it. And frankly, the diesel solution isn't all that reliable if we're considering what happens when there is, for example, a region-wide power outage and everybody's looking hard and fast for that diesel supply. <laughs> if it goes into multiple days, as we've often had, uh, that multiple day supply of diesel and everyone's relying on the same supply chain. And I can imagine uh, that whatever contract we think we have probably goes by the wayside uh, when someone else is willing to speculate and pay more and, uh, and, and diesel gets sparse. We also know that there are folks who simply, um, for whom that's just not a very uh, um, palatable solution uh, for a host of other operational reasons. And so I think it's important that whatever we do, we recognize that we're pushing folks toward an electric grid that is not reliable and not dependable. And we hope all that changes in the years ahead, but PG&E is many years and tens of billions of dollars away uh, from fixing its problems. Uh, and I haven't heard anyone yet offer a, a solution <laughs> uh, because there's no simple solution. It's complex and it requires probably multiple solutions. And what we wanna do is to get to uninterruptible supplies of electricity that are zero emissions and we're just not there yet because the technology is not there. So if we're gonna find a zero emissions path for anything more than say four, six or eight hours, which is typically what you'll have in a, a battery storage uh, uh, microgrid, for example, if you're, if you're just getting storage for a microgrid or for a particular industrial installation, that's fine for a few hours, but it won't last multiple days. Um, and I think an awful lot of experts seem to believe that distributed generation is a long-term answer. And we're several years off from the zero emission microgrid that doesn't depend on diesel generators. Um, and we'd love to see the cost of energy storage and batteries drop because we know that's gonna be really important in the years ahead to get us to that future. Um, there's also another option and I know lots been said about Bloom Energy tonight, um, but Bloom Energy is right now piloting a hydrogen fuel cell, uh, hydrogen that's not extracted from natural gas, but rather hydrogen that's separated from water through a hydrolyzer that's fueled with renewable energy. Uh, lots of challenges getting that implemented, but I've talked to a few folks uh, in the business who are not employed by Bloom and don't depend on Bloom for their income, because I want to understand clearly how realistic this is, and they believe it's actually quite viable that some of this gas infrastructure could be reutilized uh, for transmission of hydrogen. Uh, if in fact, obviously we get the hydrogen generation in place. All that's gonna take several years and we know we're not there. I should note that the users who are highly sensitive electricity reliability aren't just in the private sector, I mentioned hospitals, but the city's also one of those users. Um, and we've been struggling mightily to come up with our own solution on the microgrid front. I think folks probably remember a couple of years ago, we directed staff to go march off knowing that we had all these power safety shutoffs and other problems uh, to go figure out how we're gonna go build out some microgrids. And it turns out it's really expensive and really hard to do. And it may be that the first significantly sized microgrid is one that it's gonna probably be launched, maybe launched by Google um, because they have the resources to do it. And God love them for trying it. Uh, and, and we know it's hard. Uh, so I am concerned about us not having a clear bridge to the future, which is zero emission and reliable and resilient. I know there's been a lot said tonight that there's somehow suggesting like there's some slippery slope that we're creating with the exemption that 
staff has proposed. There have been a couple of different iterations of it. Now, somehow or another, this means that we're just going to be overrun with natural gas and building all kinds of stranded assets of natural gas infrastructure. So I asked that, okay, so this is pretty narrow. In order to qualify for it, you have to meet CARB standards, as I understand it. Uh, that's that's what's articulated in the standards. Is that right, Kerry? That you've got to have zero NOx, SOx, and particulate emissions? Yes, there's a state standard referenced. Okay. So not a lot of folks can take advantage of this, um, whether you're using natural gas or not. Yes, Bloom is one of them. Um, and and so, Carrie, roughly how many Bloom boxes do we have in this city? Do you have any idea? Um, we're not sure. Um, our it sort of review of what we had available is um, 20 or so, and um, certainly a growing number in the pipeline. Okay. So we have roughly 20. And the exemption that staff has proposed, and I prefer the second exemption that was articulated in the November 25th memorandum because it has a hard end date uh, that's not included in the first memo. I think the second memo strikes a good balance in saying, look, we need an end date to this. Uh, we're trying to drive innovation in this space. Uh, this is a bridge, and we know this is not the end solution, so let's have an end date. Um, so if you consider that Bloom's been around for more than a decade and we've got roughly 20 Bloom boxes, maybe we'll get another half dozen more. I don't know, maybe 10 more. Uh, but I don't see this as being um, the exception that swallows the rule by any stretch because that hasn't been our experience. And I know we as a city have looked at Bloom boxes and it turns out that it's a pretty expensive solution uh, and you need to be awfully, uh, awfully sensitive. Uh, to power interruptions for this to make economic sense. Uh, and so far, it hasn't made sense for the city in our conversations. And so I don't think there's a lot of users of these out there. I think it's pretty limited uh, for folks who, as I mentioned before, are deeply sensitive to power interruption. Uh, obviously, this isn't a backup source. This is an ongoing source that would run continuously 24-7. I'm mindful of the implication of that. Um, but as I said before, it's not merely greenhouse gas emissions that we are concerned about, though certainly that is a core concern, uh, but also other kinds uh, of environmental pollution. And clearly uh, the boom, boom box provides a better alternative than uh, the diesel with regard to all those other pollutants I mentioned. I think there's sort of a broader issue I'm real concerned about, which is, and I call it the hearts and minds issue. We've got to persuade a lot of pretty doubtful people about whether or not we can make this transition to all, an all electric future. And we know it's not going to happen overnight. And there's a lot of folks who are currently using gas that for whatever reason you need to continue using gas. Um, but if suddenly um, we shift completely for all new construction and those who really, really, really need a different solution can't get it. Um, you can be sure that news will travel far and wide. <laughs> and those failures are noted and they undermine our ability and our momentum to be able to build the case to getting to that all electric future, particularly when the failures happen and we know they're going to happen. The, the grid will shut down on us. We are going to have blackouts. And when that does happen, it's policies like this that will then be the target of scorn. And we need to be really clear about the fact that we are providing options for those who critically need them. So I, I am certainly um, willing to support uh, the alternatives that staff has presented. As I mentioned, I, I think I'm most inclined to support the March 25th I'm sorry, the November 25th iteration. Um, I would note that there is language articulated. I'm going to try to pull up that memo here from the 25th uh, that describes a hardship exemption. And I think. Um, as I understand it, the hardship exemption puts the decision really in staff's hands. Is that right, Carrie? In terms of 
who has the discretion here? It, yes, and I'd ask um, Lisa Joyner to add in in sort of the how does the normal hardship exemption process work when plans are submitted to uh, planning and building? Thank you, Carrie. Good evening, Lisa Joyner, Acting Deputy Director with the Building Division. So we have a couple of hardship applications currently uh, for accessibility in the ADU amnesty program. And those are evaluated with staff during the plan review process following the city ordinance or state building codes, um, the criteria set forth within them. So if something came up with the reach code hardship application and there was any doubt about the applicability, we would be reaching out to ESD to work together on the um, decision for the hardship application. Okay, thank you. Um, and to be clear, even with this recommendation from the 25th, there's still a state, the state standards still apply, Carrie, for distributed energy generation. I'm looking yes, at the language and it doesn't seem explicit in this memo, but is it incorporated from the prior? Um, that was our intent. I agree. It is um, not clear though. Okay. So I guess what I'd say is I would support something that maintained that state CARB standard in whatever distributed energy resource is used. Um, using the language from the 25th, I would also support a definition of hardship exemption that includes the verbiage that's at the top of that paragraph that it would be necessary for public health, safety, or economic welfare in the event of an electric grid outage to ensure that hardship would incorporate those concepts that is necessary in the event of electric grid outage. I think that would be awfully important. Um, I, I do want to ask a couple questions about, and, and Lisa, thanks for joining us. If either you or Rosalind could respond, I know that there was a letter um, from the local, I believe it was plumbers and pipe fitters, about uh, something relating to a expanded alternative water source requirement. And I'm not familiar at all with that. Can you tell us what that's about, what that entails? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I guess I would say I'm reluctant to impose anything like that, but certainly happy to look at it when staff has had an opportunity to digest it. Um, I do support the future of work workshop concept um, that the local has proposed uh, to help our workforce transition to an all electric future. Uh, we could certainly use more electricians, that's for sure. Uh, we know that's a huge constraint in all of our uh, construction as well as our own city operations is hiring electricians, so we need to get more trained. Um, I don't know, is Dr. Brower still on or is he, uh, I believe he's, well, that's okay. I, I think it may be hard to pull anybody back at this point. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see him on, so I won't, I won't ask him any questions at this time. Um, I, I am particularly interested in this larger question about how we get this transition in place um, to get from here to our all electric zero emission future. And every expert I talk to, and I've talked to about a half dozen, none of whom have any affiliation with any of the companies who have weighed in so far, um, because I've been very interested in this issue. Uh, they have all said, you just can't get there just by jumping to electric. <laughs> it doesn't work. There are lots and lots of problems um, that we've got to figure out. And certainly we're all familiar with the issues of the duck curve and intermittency problem of renewables and what it would do if, if we were in mass simply to go um, to electric sources that resemble what we've got in our in our power mix with San Jose Clean Energy, um, if you didn't have some other sources, Johnny. But it, it seems to me that there's 
that's just one example of many challenges we have. And, and this is a really complex problem to solve. And we don't do it simply by hoping the technology will be there. I think we need to set a really clear standard for what we're willing to tolerate, what that bridge looks like, and then push together. So I really appreciate the hard work of staff. I know you've been trying to balance a lot of very important competing interests. Um, one of those interests I know is the fact um, that there are employers who are telling us that they need this. And we're entering a very difficult time, economic period. And well, we've been in it for a while, but it's gonna get worse. I think we know with the looming shutdown order from the state. And when we're in double digit unemployment, we're gonna appreciate every one of those employers. So I don't think this is the time for us to be encouraging folks to be thinking about where else they can go outside of San Jose. Uh, we just had an announcement today that HPE moved their headquarters to Houston. Um, we are likely to hear other kinds of news from elsewhere in the Bay Area, like we heard from Palantir and others, because let's face it, this is a very high cost area. Um, and we know in very, very difficult times, employers are making decisions based on regulatory burdens and costs, and we just need to be very sensitive to that. So for all those reasons, uh, I appreciate the balancing act that the staff has tried to uh, to perform here. Uh, these are very difficult problems. I'm very confident though that we're on a great path. Uh, we are going to be the largest city, I think is, this is approved uh, in the country to embrace an all electric future. That is going to require a lot of hard and painful adjustments I know because I hear plenty of frustration from various folks in different the building community and elsewhere and we know change is hard. Um, so let's make sure that we can impose the change at a rate uh, that the entire community can tolerate. Uh, and so we're able to do it successfully uh, and hopefully irrevocably and not have to go backward. Um, so Council Member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you clearly have a very deep knowledge of this, this topic. My, I don't pretend to have as deep a knowledge and I do have some, some questions, Carrie. Um, first of all, the outreach, you touched on it a little bit, but I did want to ask, I, I understand um, my staff got the list of the people who had been contacted, but how many of them actually attended from the, I, I haven't heard a lot from the business and developer community, the people who will be in, basically implementing um, this, this ordinance in their, in their work. How many of them actually attended or spoke with you, contacted you about this topic and what were their um what were their concerns beyond what we what we know today well thank you yeah we did we sent out um a list of um to labor developers um businesses we vetted that list um, across other city departments as well including economic development and uh, planning building code enforcement so we really looked to say hey who in our entire organization did we think kind of would uh, would want to participate and would have some strong opinions and interest in shaping this ordinance? Um, I know that there were over uh, 200 participants. And Ken, if you can think specifically about which of the sectors and in total how many folks um, participated, uh, that would be great. Um, but council member, I also want to acknowledge that in um, while we sent out emails, while we asked the mayor's office to send out emails. Um, you know, one area that would be a space for uh, improvement for future efforts is to really ensure that if there's folks we absolutely ha believe need to be at the table, such as the pipe fitters union and others, that um, that we you know be more assertive in our efforts to contact them and um, and you know I guess just do a better job in that regard. And so um, so we acknowledge that. Um, and, uh, and I think in the, in the future, you'll see better participation there. But Ken, could you just give us an overview of um, kind of the categories and sheer number? Yeah, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a list uh, that uh, encompassed uh, labor groups, um, equipment manufacturers for all electric construction, uh, real estate, uh, builders and developers, uh, neighborhood associations, uh, the list went on and on. We had uh, five, uh, public webinars over the past um, five months since July. Uh, and those, those, the attendance at those workshops uh, ranged from 
uh, over 20 to over 40, depending on the, the event. Right, so I'm just asking, I'm just asking of the attendees. So I understand what, what the outreach went to, but in terms of attendees, did you see that kind of attendance from, from um, the, the labor community, the business community? So were yes. you- So in, Ken, in each of the categories about roughly how many, how many actually showed up and engaged? Yeah, and each of the workshops were uh, predominantly attended by uh, the builder and developer and real estate community. Okay, perfect. That's I very helpful. That's what I needed to know. Um, and then I, I do want to clarify um, our, and maybe this question is for Rosalind. I wasn't clear um, from the memos. Are projects that are already approved exempt from this? It sounded like the the plumbers and the steam fitters were, are very concerned about you know the immediate future. And I'm wondering if projects that are already approved are not are not included in this ban, right? They're exempt. Yes, Council Member Davis, that is correct. For so projects that have received their planning entitlements um, would be exempt, and of course, um, projects would be subject to this um, after uh, the effective date. After the if they've been entitled after that date, or do they have to be entitled today? I'm just trying to get a sense. No. Of yeah, well, projects that are currently entitled today um, are definitely exempt. Okay. And if projects do get their entitlement prior to, I believe it's the August uh, deadline of next year, they would be exempt, that's correct. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. And then I think this question is for Carrie. Um, the mayor touched on this a little bit about um, resiliency and our availability of backup power during public safety power shutoffs. Can you expound on that a little bit? What are our options? Are our options really limited to diesel generators or fuel cells or I'm assuming batteries are are in that mix, but I don't know the, the extent of that. I have Lori coming on my office hours tomorrow to talk about that a little bit for individual homes. Well, perfect. Well, I'll start and then um, Zach, if you can uh, sort of fill in the gaps if I miss anything, um, that would be really helpful. So, you know, clearly diesel generators are the, the primary or most common source of, of backup power. And they're really designed to last for short-term power outages. So a day, two days, they're not designed for these power safety shutoffs. And so, um, so we see battery storage increasing, but certainly not for large scale operations at this point, although trajectory seems to be uh, moving very quickly. Um, and, then, and then there are fuel cells as well. So there's not a lot of, as you know, not a lot of options out there today. Um, we, our hope is that as we and other cities uh, move away from natural gas, that that opens a space for innovation and um, opens uh, customers up to purchasing. Okay, thank you. Zach, did you wanna add anything? Um, uh, only that, um, basically I you know, echo what, what Carrie said and, and um, you know, for a uh, no interruption, sort of, you know, a data center kind of application, yes, a battery is not gonna be that for longer than, you know, let's say four hours, or if you had a lot of them, maybe six or eight. Um, you know, for a, a more limited load sort of support, if you install batteries with with solar, you know, that's going to, the solar is going to recharge the battery every day. And depending on the weather, um, you know, you're going to be able to to have that go longer and, and recharge every day. Right. And as we saw with wildfires uh, intersecting with the power shutoffs, that's not exactly completely reliable either, right? Of course. Uh, yeah. Without problem on many factors yes yeah yeah okay so i i appreciate that that's very helpful um i just uh we we as a council and i personally am very committed to our our climate smart plan and our goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our city and i think carrie you said it very well we need to be flexible but committed to our long-term objective and i i appreciate all the work that you that you've done to to craft that um flexibility <laughs> as well as our commitment and i 
I personally, I want to encourage the adoption of the, the green technology that, that already exists and that's available. Um, but at the same time, you know, the mayor mentioned that I think it's important for us to be pragmatic about our current limitations and the cost effectiveness of what is available as, as we've just heard <laughs> about the, the reliability of what is available as well in the, in the long term and in light of public safety power shutoffs. That's, that's really important. Um, so I, I want to encourage the, the adoption of, of what's available, but also the development and innovation of green tech. And I think having a timeline and providing that bridge, I liked the way you put that mayor, um, providing that bridge is going to be important to us. Um, one of the, as we've, as we've heard, and I think a public commenter also no, noted, the technology just isn't there yet for completely greenhouse gas free uh, and cost effective fuel cells. And I, I, I'm sensitive to that and the need for uninterruptible power supplies for, for um, public health, public safety and, and, uh, and economic hardship. So I think we, I, I agree, I think we need to take that measured approach and continue to reevaluate in future years. And I, I, I think another commenter, it might have, it might have been Shani who said things are are evolving quicker than than they used to, and and so that's why we have a timeline in um, why staff put forward that timeline on the um, November twenty fifth supplemental. So I'm going to, in light of all of that, <laughs> make a motion. Um, for a staff recommendation, including the uh, attached ADU exemption from the supplemental of the 16th and the supplemental from the 25th uh, with, with one edit in the hardship exemption, if an applicant for a newly constructed building believes that the type of project or physical site conditions or necessary operational requirements, and then here's the addition, or the public health, safety, or economic welfare in the event of an electric grid outage, that's the addition, make it a hardship or infeasible to meet the requirements of this chapter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with that, and then I would also like to include that, um, that the clarification that we include the state standards for uh, distributed energy, the CARB standards. And I don't know exactly where that goes, but. That's my motion. Second. Thank you. Um, so another commenter said, uh, our work is not done and implied that, that we should maybe finish the job this evening. And I just wanna say, it is true that our work is not done and it will not be done tonight, but we will continue to make progress with this action. And as technology advances, we are committed to continuing to take further action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, appreciate the presentation and the work from, from staff and certainly all the uh, commentary from our community that, that came in today. And obviously this has been a, a pretty hot topic uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, as was mentioned, receiving uh, several hundred correspondents, uh, the majority of which speaking out in, in opposition to some of these latest supplementals. Um, and, I, and I wanted to kind of dive in on, on some of this, but I'll, I'll do some highlights first. I think just in general, um, you know, appreciate the, the community advocates that have helped get us this far as the mayor pointed out and, and certainly our city staff that have done the work and knowing that, that passing this ordinance is really gonna cement our commitment uh, that we set out to make years ago on preserving our environment and specifically reducing our production of greenhouse gas emissions here in the city of San Jose. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, being the largest city to, to pass an ordinance like this, uh, should we pass it, um, setting a precedent for, for the rest of our country and, and one that I think we've, we've stood on now for, for a number of years um, as I think we have, we have made a statement to recognize the impacts that we as human beings uh, are having on our environment and we're having on this world and, and quite frankly, the, the world that we are leaving 
for future generations. And so having said that, I, I, I certainly was looking forward to this item coming a couple of weeks ago and, and, and obviously was concerned about the, the timing and the introduction of the, the, the supplemental, uh, the initial supplemental and the exemption uh, and what appeared to be a lack of, of analysis uh, presented to the council in order to, to make a, a decision. And I know the mayor spoke uh, briefly yet eloquently about such pollutants like uh, NOx and SOx and, uh, and uh, that may have convinced Councilmember Davis uh, that he understands the issue deeply, but I don't think any of us on the council can claim that this is an issue we understand very well. And what I'm most concerned about doing is, is approving any further exemptions with so little, or what appears to be so little analysis. And certainly when that exemption or those exemptions come with so much opposition from our environmental advocates that, it, that have helped get us to this point. Um, and certainly uh, what was not presented in the initial uh, memorandum from our staff. Now, having said that, I'll be clear, uh, as I pointed out already, I, I am no expert either. Uh, and in fact, I'm at the moment neither for or against uh, these exemptions. Uh, where I certainly lean is on the side of our environmental advocates, uh, and I'm not comfortable with these additional exemptions prior to knowing that the proper analysis was conducted. And uh, personally, I, I appreciate Bloom and, and having to get to learn about them as a, as a, a local company, especially for what they did uh, for our, our state and our community this, this summer and this year. Uh, and specifically that they are uh, a San Jose based company. But this decision is about, is not about that. Uh, it's about the future that we're trying to create, again, for, for future generations to come and, and continuing that progress as leaders in environmental justice. And so I, I did wanna ask staff, uh, maybe you can start with an explanation on, on how we got here with these, these these last two uh, or last minute two supplemental memos after what was uh, really a, a, a lot of time and, and work that went into this effort. Thank you, Council Member. Um, it's, um, as, the, as the item was uh, put on the agenda, um, Bloom Energy reached out to us and um, indicated that they had not been tracking the issue and um, had concerns, and on behalf of their businesses, had concerns that um, certain companies would be challenged um, to operate uh, without interruption given the uh, ongoing power outages. So as we explored the issue on a staff level and uh, agreed swiftly, um, we, our assessment is that to meet our climate smart objectives, we need to densify and we need to increase local jobs and we need to get people out of their cars. And we wanted to balance the goals of Climate Smart to include economic prosperity, um, equity, inclusion, and environmental long and short-term goals. Um, so our assessment included saying, you know, getting in the way of densification would create more long-term challenges to achieving climate smart than, um, than allowing for a few more years for the bloom boxes or other similar technologies to be installed because those technologies have a lifespan of five to 10 years. And so we require that <clears throat> the new, new construction be connected to the grid so that we can then move um, away from that uh, fuel cell when the grid is more stable. And right now, unfortunately, it, the grid is just not stable. And so that created some hardships for, um, for our businesses that felt they could not be down for six to seven days. Thank you. Um, and it, it, I guess kind of diving into to some of the, the opportunities that we have here, um, I, I, I want to understand maybe a, a little bit better on, 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 on sort of the decision we may make with uh, what our 
environmental advocates are, are asking for, which is your original memo versus uh, what looks like now a, a motion for the, the second supplemental memorandum that, that came out. Um, and so I wanted to see if staff can answer a couple questions. Uh, number one, there's been some uh, allegations kind of thrown around in regards to the, the CO2 emissions and, and the mayor pointed out that I think um, you know, clearly what it looks like in, in the use of generators, diesel generators, that the, the CO2 emissions potentially would be would be less than a, a, a fuel cell running 365. Um, does staff have any analysis on that in regards to what truly the the sort of emissions comparisons are between the two? And yeah. just to be clear, I, I said it would be greenhouse gas emissions, uh, not CO2, just to be clear. Okay, thank you. And yeah. maybe actually, I'm, I'm happy to, staff, if you can sort of answer for both of that in, 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 regard, in regard to uh, also even just a comparison of, of the emissions. Um, yeah, so uh, so the, um, the, the analysis that we did assumes that um, the diesel generators would only run three and a half days a year. And so we looked at a five-year period and said, um, uh, you know, using San Jose Clean Energy um, no during normal operations and then reverting to, uh, to diesel backup um, for those three and a half days, which may be too short to acknowledge that. Um, the bloom energy fuel cells are about six and a half times more polluting um, from a greenhouse gas standpoint than the using the diesel backup. And that's because, as we've noted, they're once they're on, they're on um, continuously. And so, you know, part of the question is sort of who needs that? And that's where we, you know, could consider moving to the hardship exemption. Um, and, um, and then how would you run, could you continue to refill your diesel generator over a longer period of time? Historically, we've seen that we have, companies have been able to, um, to keep the diesel generators operating. Diesel generators, though, do create um, localized increased air pollution in, um, in the form of NOx and particulates. And so that would be um, exposure to those, uh, those residents in that area. So, you know, there, there's good and bad to both. In, in the long term, though, we don't think that um, natural gas fuel fuel cells make uh, sense for, uh, for our climate objectives. So definitely um, a compromise to hit our business goals and our climate goals, but in the, in the longer term, uh, continuing to operate natural gas fuel cells would not meet our climate goals. And so, and you, you made a mention that, that maybe you'd, you'd made some uh, too conservative of, of, of assumptions on the maybe three days. Um, so if it were were more and you have some power safety shutoffs, um, the difference though that you were calculating was around yeah. six times worse. So, yeah. I mean, maybe it's right. five times worse or something. Is that what we're right. assuming, right? It's, right. St so, it's still a number of times worse. Yes, so, so using our three and a half days, it's, it's six and a half, or I'm sorry, 6.5 times more. Um, you know, we didn't include, you do have to start up and test diesel generators once a month. We didn't include that, so if I sort of clean up my math a little bit, it's probably four and a half times more polluting. Okay, uh, I think I don't. Know, just a, a potential example as well. I think of uh, we didn't necessarily uh, fully, you know, I think take the time to to analyze this as robustly as maybe um, you would have wanted to, and certainly as I would have wanted to. But uh, appreciate that. Obviously, we have this opportunity now to kind of talk through it, and, and I would agree with you there that that uh, it still looks like it would be a number of times greater. Uh, can you speak a little bit more in detail? Because I'm certainly not an expert on on some of these localized particulates, um, and and sort of what those impacts are in a trade off for fuel cells. It looks like as an overall, you know, sort of, I guess statement you're saying that that the fuel cells natural gas fuel cells are not necessarily going to be helping us meet our climate goals um and so but are you able to kind of dive deeper on some of those those trade-offs 
So certainly. So um, when you're um, when you're operating a diesel generator, there are um, there are you know uh, criteria pollutants that are emitted during the um, the fire or the operation of that that diesel generator. Those tend to be more localized in nature, um, in in a you know certain vicinity around the operation of the diesel generator. Um, the you know bloom energy cells so are are cleaner in terms of the near term nearby exposure to uh, to residents, but then more polluting from a greenhouse gas perspective. Um, and so you know our thought is over the next decade, PG&E has indicated. Uh, that they will require that decade to stabilize the grid. And so if in the December 2023 timeframe, we can say, hey, do, you know, how does it look like technology is evolving and, and how, what shape is the grid in? We would be in a more com confident, comfortable position to message to our potential uh, incoming businesses and new construction that, hey, the, you can count on the grid. To, to run your business, it's okay to develop here. And so, um, so that's the, where the, the real trade-off is. We knew going into it that the natural gas fuel cells uh, are significantly uh, worse for climate. Uh, and so I don't know if we had had more time if um, we would have done much more research because it's pretty widely known. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess the, the difference between sort of your original memo versus this second supplemental and the, and the motions on the table, do you have an analysis on the impact to our climate smart goals? What, what the, the, what the difference might be depending on which one of those directions um, we go? We, we don't because the thing is that we assume that in by 2030, these, um, natural gas fuel cells would most likely not be operating. So we sort of get to the same place, but we get there 10 years later, which as some of our environmental community have commented today and, and in the past, it's the next decade that is really the most important that we act. So, so we wanted to limit the sort of increase over time. So each, each fuel cell kind of you know, requires obviously an offset somewhere else, but but it's the same type of trade-off we're making when we look at um, the uh, the power mix for San Jose Clean Energy, right? So we're making these trade-offs in almost everything we do to try and not have one decision have a ripple effect to impact negatively all the other climate smart actions, and so um, so it's definitely a trade-off. Um, but to directly answer your question, I can't tell you how we would make that up today, because we need to look at kind of how many we think would be permitted and then um, and then how quickly we could adjust. But I am confident that the faster we can get people out of their cars and out off the roadways and reduce congestion, that that will have a very significant impact in um, achieving our climate smart goals. Okay, but just to reiterate, as you, you, you have now twice, um, we don't have that analysis on on sort of the, the specific trade-offs or impacts to our climate smart goals between this latest supplemental and your original direction. Definitely. So we definitely don't have that. Part of that is it's impossible to project how many would be installed. So development is slow right now. I don't know how many would come through. Rosalind, do you have any any um, insight into how many might be permitted? <coughs> Um, I think it may be somewhat difficult um, to try to estimate that at this point, um, given where we are in the in the market and the in the recession. So I, I would hate to um, try to guess on that right now. It, and I, I, I'm not intending on anybody to try to answer that question right now. Uh, obviously, what I'm what I'm indicating is that we didn't do that analysis ahead of time and we make assumptions all the time on, on impacts, uh, as you mentioned right now, Carrie, in regards to uh, vehicle miles traveled, right? Based on a decision we make, we make assumptions on, on what sort of changes uh, may incur in people's driving habits. We don't truly know 
the answer to those. But in this case, I think we may even be able to make more educated assumptions because we can just reach out to Bloom and try to get an idea of how many people they might be working with. And we have, I, I think it's a little odd that we don't even know necessarily how many Bloom boxes are out there um, when I, I assume we should be able to, to ask Bloom. I'm, I'm guessing they would know since they sold them. Um, but I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not asking that this be answered now. I'm sort of just asking that it, was this actually conducted or not? And, and it wasn't. That's all I was just trying to clarify. And, and I would have liked to have seen that to truly understand the implications between the the two proposed directions or at least this this latest supplemental and thank you council member my apologies for not um if if i'm not being clear um what i i guess the other piece to that equation is not just sort of what would offsets would we have to um, employ to um, make up for uh, allowing these bloom boxes the other piece of that equation is how many businesses did not locate in San Jose or how much new construction did not occur to infill um, and densify because they they were um, uncertain about the stability of power in our city. And so I don't have I don't have both sides of that equation um, to guess and I, I don't know that I could guess that. Um, obviously my recommendation is I think I don't want to get in the way of businesses densifying and so I think the trade-off is worth it but I don't, I, I don't have the math as you've, um, as you've stated, I don't have the math to back that up. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's sort of just what I was clarifying. And I do understand your, your, your point here that, uh, you know, potentially you, you might not have had better math anyways. I, I, I just beg to differ that I think we could have made some educated guesses here as we do a lot of times when we make assumptions. And so, um, especially if the council had, had directed that to, to come forward. Um, perfect or not, I think we, we could have had some some comparative analysis. Uh, and additionally, I think one of the things that I think should be clear is that regardless of your original memorandum or, or either one of your supplementals, there are still allowable opportunities within the ordinance uh, that would, would grant, for instance, the hardship exemption. And so it's not necessarily that there would be some outright ban and there wouldn't be an opportunity uh, for a company should they desire and then ultimately be granted an exemption to utilize such a, a fuel cell um, backup uh, or, or a, a bloom box, for instance. Is that correct? Um, Chris, I'm going to, Chris Burton, could you um, maybe share a little bit of the economic development perspective in terms of what you're hearing from our um, businesses and developers on that topic? <laughs> Yeah, sure. I, I think, um, you know, as we look at the market um, and try and understand kind of the future for development and the, and the sort of opportunity, um, there are definitely, you know, there is definitely the ability for businesses to work within the ordinance. I think kind of back to your previous uh, question, council member, um, you know, we do see development sloping slowing down uh, significantly. And so uh, probably the priority over the next three to five years will be um, expansion or, or sort of um, renovation and, and reuse of existing buildings, right? Which is not included in the ban. Um, so people do have the opportunity to use these types of facilities on existing buildings um, or sort of within the space of that hardship exemption uh, kind of leave some room for, for businesses to continue to make those types of investments. Okay, so interpreting that, I, I think, the answer to my question was yes, that, that there is indeed sort of an avenue. And in fact, there's there's multiple avenues. One is, as you point out, which is um, older buildings being renovated. But two, there is still this hardship exemption um, as an opportunity. It might not be the, the obviously the easiest path um, that, that um, advocates um, of, of, of bloom technology or, or other fuel cells would would or that we've, we've heard them tonight ask for. Um, but indeed, there is a pathway there, especially if we are truly concerned about some of these these uses um, that I think, uh, you know, we would also want to be granted a hardship exemption um, because you know we want them to have that sort of backup um, opportunity. Uh, but yet, making our 
our sort of our, our line in the sand be one that is more firm versus I think as some of the advocates have pointed out today as well, starting off with an exemption. Um, I think instead we, we can make those decisions one at a time to truly understand uh, if indeed uh, a, a hardship exemption would be would be granted or necessary or would be I should say necessary and then granted. And so uh, a couple more questions. Um, I want to. I've heard that that these. I guess that the gas pipelines that we have, um, that potentially, if other low carbon fuel or or hydrogen, hydrogen for instance, becomes available, um, could the pipelines that we have uh, for natural gas could they actually be converted for for hydrogen use to be flowing through them? One question, and then the second would be: Could these fuel cells? Uh, actually switch over from the natural gas use to hydrogen, which which may not be a, a question for staff, and I'm happy to have um, maybe invite somebody else from, from Bloom to, to jump in, but I'll, I'll let staff try to answer at least the first one. I'm going to ask, Zach, could you, from a community energy standpoint, um, speak to the conversation around converting the natural gas infrastructure to hydrogen? What you think that timeline might look like, and is it feasible? Unfortunately, no. You know, we're in the uh, we're in the the electricity generation business, not the, the gas to buildings business. So I'm I'm not I can't speak on that technically. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think that there are certainly folks who are heavily invested in that effort now, and I, I, that's one reason why I was asking to see if uh, the doctor from UC Irvine. Um, I'll see if he's still there. Uh, Jacob Brower, I think he's in the waiting room or on the attendee list. If you're interested in the answer to that question, I know he's been studying that, and I just, I believe he may be he involved in the project in. down in SoCal Gas. I just okay, speak, Mayor. Okay, great, Dr. Brower, do you, do you want to give a take a shot at responding to the question about the use of hydrogen in either fuel cells or in the pipeline? I think his device is still muted. Sir, if you're trying to speak right now, we can't hear you because your device is muted. Okay, his device is still muted. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna assume we're not gonna get an answer at this moment from Dr. Brower until he's able to unsettle his device. But I know okay. there are certainly folks who are, who are following, I'm guessing from Bloom and elsewhere that have an opinion. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask the second question if maybe somebody wanted to, to chime in um I, I i'm curious though from staff standpoint do, do you not have uh an understanding of of that or, or an opportunity to, to answer that question so um we do we do understand that there is a significant and increasing interest in um creating a uh, hydrogen pipeline there are uh, longer range vehicles, trucks, et cetera, that are able to use um, to use that now. And, um, and we would expect to see more interest in that, but um, it does sound very expensive. And so I don't think that transition is something um, that would happen without significant consumer uptake. And so um, I think it is likely to be feasible, likely something to be explored and could provide uh, a lot of potential for um, for backup power so that we have a little bit more redundancy in our system. Um, we do know that fuel cell companies are looking at it and, and piloting technologies, but um, we have not done any assessment um, in San Jose, but, uh, but I do know that the, the state is interested in it, in converting to hydrogen. But again, I don't know the timeline on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, we got a joint letter from, uh, Menlo Spark Mothers Out Front in the Sierra Club, talking about sort of I guess that 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 it's that it's not necessarily possible for some of these conversions. And again, I'm I'm not an expert, so I, I'm I'm looking for at least on my end, our, our you know our staff to sort of help with some of that understanding. If if indeed right uh, these these natural gas pipelines can be converted or not, and uh, and and it sounds like we don't have the 
the best answer, correct? Well, my understanding is that the um, there is uh, the condition of the natural gas pipeline is in need of attention anyway. Um, so I, I would um, assume, like I said, it'll be a, a long-term and expensive um, initiative. Okay, and I will. I I'll, I want to kick it over first to see if there is somebody, Mayor, on the on the call. Um, who spoke with us back in uh, September from the Smith Group, Stet Sanborn, that may have um, maybe a, a more detailed answer, and then I'll then I'll maybe pose the second question as well, and and see if there's somebody from Bloom that, that wanted to jump on. But I don't know if Stet is is, is on the on the yeah. call. If he can be on. I'm here. I'm here. If you guys can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, so I can I can address that question um, a little bit, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak. So typically, um, my understanding is that under with existing natural gas pipelines, there's a maximum blend of hydrogen to natural gas that could fit within the existing infrastructure without major um, upgrades. And I think that upper limit is around 20% blend of hydrogen to natural gas in existing pipelines. Now, remember though, that that's an offset. It's sort of taking the place um, of natural gas, but you're not going, you're not eliminating the fugitive emissions from natural gas that are leaking from the current infrastructure. So I think that's really important is that there is a viable path for hydrogen um, and hydrogen-based fuel cells uh, within uh, a renewable energy portfolio, um, but it's not likely that long-term that's going to be based on the existing natural gas pipeline infrastructure. Um, you know, Talk to anybody in San Bruno and ask them if they want hydrogen being pumped through um, the pipeline going through their neighborhood. Um, and it's, it's not going to result in um, the sort of savings um, that people are projecting. Now, there is actually substantial opportunities for hydrogen in localized storage environments, on-site production from renewable energy through electrolysis or other uh, technologies, and on-site storage um, is probably more viable than transport uh, through pipelines. The big energy hog from hydrogen standpoint is gonna be the compression energy, the energy required to compress it to store it. Um, so that's typically where the big energy hog goes and the um, related CO2 emissions with um, hydrogen um, are associated with compression energy. Th thank you, Stead. Uh, I appreciate you jumping in. And it does sound like um, Carrie had, had had some understanding in regards to the infrastructure itself is, is one of the yeah. major problems. Um, Correct. So I appreciate, appreciate that answer. Thank you. Uh, and then, uh, uh, Mayor, I don't know if you're aware of somebody from blue I, I apologize i don't have somebody to to call up um yeah i just uh, ask if uh somebody from bloom uh, could raise their hand uh if they'd like to speak on this issue i know that bloom is currently testing uh the use of their fuel cell in south korea where they do have the hydrogen infrastructure and i know that because they actually presented this to the city uh to see if we were interested in also in piloting something like this. And they're, I know they're working, they just signed some deal with so SoCal Gas on a pilot down there as well. Um, so I see Mark uh, Bernardi. Uh, Henry, if we could enable him to speak. I just gave him permission there. Great. Uh, Mr. Bernardi? Yes. Hi, Mark. Hi, um, I just, I'm in the installations team. And so I do the installs locally, but we, yes, um, I would defer to anyone on the product development team, but <clears throat> yes, in Korea, we do have those, uh, um, we are developing solutions across um, using hydrogen and uh, we have natural gas here. But I, I think the other aspect of this I wanna stress is that the, the um, we, it's one source isn't the solution. So like the balance of, oh, you can do natural gas and oh, you can use hydrogen only so that you leverage what you have to work with is that that is the solution. So I know the, like all electrical, it still comes from other sources. And so it's, it's a complicated answer of you need to balance, right. but the- I so I, I was I guess, just texted that your CTO yeah. is jumping on the call right now. Your chief okay, technology yeah, officer. Definitely. Perhaps yeah, we, should, she, we should ask him a question. Yeah, uh, that, uh, Venkat, uh, could you please raise your hand, Venkat? Yeah, if if it, 
that would be great. And if they don't mind, just kind of stick into the to the question. Yeah, I understand. Um, it wasn't. Uh, thanks. It wasn't. Super yeah, yeah, responsive. I understand. So, might might have uh, been the, the wrong Venkat, Were you I able know. to hear the question from Councilmember Pross? No, I just joined. Uh, so. Um, okay. Perhaps uh, Councilmember Pross, you can ask the question. You can respond. Yeah. So hi, thanks, Venk. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to answer it. And the question was really twofold. It was wanting to understand better if our our current natural gas pipelines can actually be converted over to have hydrogen, for instance, flowing through them. And specifically, you know, could the the already installed fuel cells be able to switch over? Um, and so it's a, that two part. If you don't mind trying to answer it. Yes, the current lines can be definitely can handle the hydrogen free stuff. It's not a problem. You can inject the line. There are some limits put in with the different regulations. Uh, European standards go for a higher uh, level of hydrogen. Here, anywhere between the 15 to 19 percent of hydrogen can be injected into the pipeline. Or there are European standards can go a little bit higher, but uh, that's normally the range we are looking at. Second question to answer fuel cells, yes, they are convertible. Uh, currently the fuel cells can handle, even the current generation of the product we ship today can handle a mix of hydrogen and, and natural gas up to, up to 45 to 50% of hydrogen. So we can do a pretty high percentage of hydrogen if it's available. The only product we are releasing next year, or actually it's going out to Korea this year, is hydrogen only product. Uh, the reason being is um, hydrogen only product can simplify the system. We can simplify the system to deal with hydrogen only product. That's what we are doing. But the current product that we are shipping to the customers can handle natural gas and a mix of natural gas and hydrogen, up to 50% of hydrogen. Thank you, and, and I don't know if you, you heard, it sounds like you might not have heard uh, Stet Sanborn uh, from the Smith Group. Uh, he spoke, and, and Kerry uh, spoke from our city staff that one of the challenges that the, the, the you know conversion, I guess, could be possible uh, with our current natural gas pipelines, but that one of the challenges is that that infrastructure is not necessarily something anybody would want to use um, and, and one of the examples pointed out was obviously the, the leaks that are occurring throughout that system and specifically what we saw here in San Bruno that, um, that, that were, even though maybe it would be possible that it's not likely that our current infrastructure would actually be utilized uh, because of its age and issues. I see, okay, I see. Do you, I mean, do you share that you understanding or? Yeah, that. That a little bit, uh, I was, I didn't know that their aging is an issue. The, if you go with the LFL, which is the flame validity limit, the safe limit is definitely below 20% is a safe limit. It doesn't have the same criteria as a pure nitrogen, of a hydrogen line. So I'm a little surprised. Yeah, and I, I don't think it was so much the mix. I think, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think it was so much the mix. It seems like everybody kind of agrees that under 20% is the, yeah. the mix, yeah. but I think it's more, the infrastructure itself, regardless mm -hmm. of what the mix is, regardless of what you're running through there, it sounds like the infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. is not something that, that would be sustainable to be used in the future anyways, i.e. meaning we would need to lay new pipe. And so I just, I, 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 if you don't have any, you know, understanding or, or comment on that, that's fine. I just, and I know it's like you didn't I, get I, to hear the, the commentary. I, so far the conversations I had with uh, South Gal Gas and others, uh, I haven't really heard that the current line will be a problem and we have to put a new line. That's news to me, but I can verify on that. Okay. No, no. And that, that even just that comment is helpful. I, I'm, I'm trying to, to get an understanding and we're, we have yeah, some different yeah. understandings and, and it sounds like. Yeah. The, um, the, the, please bear in mind, persistence. if, if uh, this is an interesting observation, if you really end up in trying to put a new line in, uh, that will be that will be quite detrimental to the uh, utilities to go with the hydrogen injection. So uh, the fact that they are all thinking about it, uh, not just here worldwide, is the 
fact that we can be injecting into the same line, not necessarily com creating a completely new line. It's, I never heard of that. So I can confirm it, but in general, I don't, I haven't heard any, any problem with the, with the line itself, injecting the line. Right, it's going to be great. Okay. Thank you. Serene Katamaran, could, you, could oh. you stay on just a bit yeah. longer after Councilman Pross is done? Because I think there are some other questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's it for my questions. But yeah, thank you for, for jumping on. Um, so, well, I'm sorry, Mayor, that's that's it for my questions for him. But I, I got a couple okay. more. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, so, it just, uh, I, I'm curious, and I know it, it sounded like Councilor Davis mentioned this as well or asked this, but uh, if staff can reiterate, what would be the current impact or the impact, excuse me, to current owners of, of Bloom Boxes? Um, if we were to to pass simply your first memo and not this supplemental, uh, there would be no impact to any either any existing construction um, for either version of any of the versions of the memo. Okay, thank you. And and then again to reiterate, um, if if we did move with just the, the first memo there uh, maybe you can walk me through how maybe a new project might be able to use a bloom box or any gas fuel cells um would that you know if you can describe would that be through for instance what's described in the ordinance as uh the limited exemption if they were manufacturing industrial food establishments uh at least up until 2022 or or could that also be uh, or maybe it's an and or through the hardship exemption for uh, other types of developments so if you can just kind of walk me through that, how that, that might still be possible. So thank you. So the hardship exemption um, could be applicable depending on the, the um, obviously the, the condition of that company and the availability of alternatives. Ken, if, um, if you could um, provide a little more depth on that and then Rosalind, if you um, or Lori have anything to add, um, that would be great. Sure. The, the uh, definition we use uh, for industrial is the, the state's definition, and there is a subcategory within that for electrical generation. Um, I, I can't comment on how Bloom would sort of navigate um, themselves into that position, um, because right now their installations are behind the meter, um, so that, that would have to be something that they would, they would look at. That's how they could fit into that, but I think it is an and/or, and uh, they could go through if it was just the original memo, uh, a hardship exemption process as well. I'm sorry, Lisa. Did you have anything to add um, from a planning standpoint? Um, so I'm with building. So with the hardship <laughs> application in building, um, that's fine. It would really be on the applicant to explain to us how they meet the hardship requirement um, and, and what their needs are for us to evaluate. So it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Council Member Pross? We're not able to hear you right now. I think your device is muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you about that. I was talking to myself, apologize. Um, so I appreciate that. And I guess, so for, it sounds like there are the two options then, correct? There are these limited exemptions uh, up until 2022, and then there are continued hardship exemptions um, would be, and obviously that's a case by case basis as sort of was, was described here that I guess we obviously couldn't give an example until we actually get a case to, to move forward. Um, but that, that those, those would be the two opportunities for uh, a new project and a new development if they wanted to indeed implement the use of a bloom box or a, a fuel cell. Correct, is that a correct summary? Yes, um, and I would just ask Chris Burton if you could maybe share what you heard from some developers in terms of why, why they were or were not comfortable with um, the need to apply for a hardship exemption and, and how that uncertainty impacted their decisions. And, and before Chris jumps in, though, if you can answer one question, Carrie, is the difference between sort of that, that the first memo and, and this second supplemental, is it, is it, I guess it's, it's two or four years then really, right? Depending on if you are a, 
a new development that fits the limited exemption, then it's really a two-year difference. If you are going for the hardship exemption, if you don't fit this limited exemption, then essentially it's the difference is four years, correct? Because obviously you'd have to qualify for a hardship immediately versus in 2024. I think yes, but Ken, more definitively, is the answer yes? I think the hardship exemption, and, and Lisa can correct me here if I'm wrong, is is something that stays on the books for uh, forever, uh, right? In perpetuity, yeah. Correct. So any, so you can always apply any at any time, um, apply for a hardship exemption, um, meeting that criteria. Okay, thank you. And sorry, I, I cut off, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, so we did uh, speak to some developers. I think, you know, part of the issue around any sort of limited time program is around the uncertainty of timeline. When you think about development, um, even sort of four years is relatively short term, given the sort of decision making and the process that occurs. So, um, so I think that's just sort of some of the things that we've uh, heard around the, the sort of challenges around hardship exemptions, plus the sort of necessary burden of proof that companies have to demonstrate and that you know some of those um, requirements are a little can be you know a little bit subjective and, and sort of they need to work around that um, so we'd, we'd heard some early concerns about that nothing sort of majorly specific though thank you Chris uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here mayor and uh, I noticed we didn't put the time range of that mayor um, no, I guess we so, did, did we? <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm still under 15 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> I, but in, 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 in wrapping up here and just summarizing, uh, especially what, what actually what after Chris was just saying, um, uh, I think there's there's still most definitely uh, a an opportunity for new development to take advantage of, of this fuel cell technology. Um, regardless of, of the direction that we go. And at a worst case scenario, what it sounds like is that it's inconvenient. If we move with staff's initial recommendation, um, I think what we're saying is, is it's gonna be a little bit more inconvenient for a business to, to do so. Um, I recognize you know, others may have different opinions, but that's, that's how I am now understanding this and, and sort of even what after Chris just stated um, and all that we've heard, I think that the, the hardship exemption or for the next two years, the limited exemption provides enough of an opportunity for any new development. Uh, should they truly wish to utilize what we, I think can confirm is dirtier uh, uh, technology uh, and, and really something that as Carrie points out is not likely to, to last uh, regardless. And that, that we're, we're obviously all hopeful that we have some cleaner tech uh, or, or, or energy generation um, propelling us forward anyways. Um, and, and so uh, I would be much more inclined to uh, support the initial memo coming from, from staff. And uh, at the same time, I, I certainly recognize some of the, the, the challenges and, and one of them specifically was for our, our workforce and um, and I appreciate the uh, letter coming in from the, the South Bay Labor Council and, and the one from Local 393, uh, as this is gonna be most impactful to, to their members uh, and, and their line of work. Um, my understanding is that uh, the, the local in San Francisco actually got behind uh, some of their efforts. And uh, it sounds like there is uh, indeed, uh, a path forward. And for me, I think what it really is, is it includes um, the direction that the mayor had stated he would support as well, which I don't think it made it into the initial motion, but um, I would like to do a substitute motion and, and move staff's uh, original memorandum, but then also include this work on convening a future uh, of work workshop with the key stakeholders from labor business and the environmental community uh, that was originally recommended by Local 393 on March 31st, or excuse me, uh, it was originally uh, recommended by them and then have that done by March 31st, uh, as was in uh, the, the letter um, 
uh, that, that we all received. And so that'll be my motion. All right, motion from Council Member Prowse. Is there a second? All right. Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the motion? Yeah, the motion is uh, to move staff's original memoranda and then to include in it a direction that was uh, included in a, a letter that we got earlier today um, from the South Bay Labor Council that asked to convene a future of work workshop with key stakeholders from labor business and the environmental community. Um, so it's, it's those two items. I'll, I'll second that. Councilman Prowse, just to be clear, it does not include the recommendation uh, from the local about including the exemption. Is that correct? That is that is correct, Mary. Yeah. It, it, um, sorry, I thought that was intuitive, just in the in the approving staff's original memo. But no, I'll, I'll make that clear. Yes, it does not include that. Okay. All right. Um, I I know um, the chief technology officer from. Loom is uh, Mr. Van Catamaran has taken time to uh, answer questions. So, uh, Councilman Depp, if you don't mind, if I just jump in, I'd like to ask a couple of questions in case he needs to go. Yes, please. And uh, uh, let's just value his time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Van Catamaran, I appreciate you taking a moment here. I'm not sure. I think you're still with us. Yeah, you are. Yeah, I'm um, here. I'm here. Great. Um, just, to be, just to be really clear, um, currently the fuel cells can be either adapted or are already ready to use hydrogen as a fuel. Is that right? As I said, the current system can do natural gas and the biogas and mix of natural gas and hydrogen today. Okay. And a, is there a 100% hydrogen it's a, option? It's a, yeah, it's available. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's available right now. If you have the hydrogen infrastructure ready to put hydrogen right. in, all we have to do is, is a, we'll swap out the module. We don't have to change anything. The, the reason being is that we have a higher efficiency module that we are building right now. So we'll take a, every box has got a fuel cell module. If you go into, if the hydrogen is ready, then we go out and swap out the module, that's it. Right. And I, my understanding is you're also testing a hydrolyzer that will provide that hydrogen on site so you don't in fact need a distribution system that theoretically this would be distributed generation right there would be that's right that's right we are particular microgrid on... particular site could have the hydrogen on site that's right is that right yeah the electrolyzer that we are building today um, is capable of taking um, low cost electricity and converting the water into hydrogen that can be on site Either it could be fueling state gap, or if you if you do have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, right, and you can put the on-site uh, hydrogen generator that can fit in. There are multiple applications we can put the on-site hydrogen generator itself. Okay, it's, re it's reversing the fuel cell into electrolysis mode. Right. Yep. Okay, just trying to understand clearly uh, because clearly um, what your company is offering as some other companies are offering is a distributed generation solution. Could you just tell us why distributed generation is relevant in a world where we've got a grid that's creaky at best? Yeah, <laughs> I think the, um, as you might know, microgrid is getting popular uh, because of the reliability issues with the grid, the PSPS events and the whole bunch of stuff uh, uh, behind the meter is easy to go and insert the distributed energy resource, just like our fuel cell in the microgrid environment. And also some of the work we are doing with uh, uh, PUC as well as, uh, as PG&E is, we can also extend it to in front of the meter solution also. So essentially you can create a grid at the substation level also with, uh, with our fuel cell. So both okay. are feasible, we are ready for both of them. The flexibility exists. So the way we see it is we on the front end, we are fuel flexible, right? Today, natural gas, blend of natural gas with hydrogen, biogas or the feedstock uh, from a, biogas is obviously the carbon neutral. So we can also replace with the hydrogen from a fuel cell uh, side of it, have the fuel flexibility. On the downstream of it, the electrical interconnection, we have in front of the meter, behind the meter, integration with solar or any other DERs, 
and creating the microgrid. Both are both are possible today. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate right. it. Um, uh, should I stay, stay there or sign off? Uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> could you hang around in case a, a couple other folks have questions? I see sure, some other sure. hands up. Yeah, okay, I can. Thank you very stay, much, sir. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Diab? Yes, sir. Um, so I, I just wanted to jump in and uh, give my two cents on this. I, I, you know, everyone's talking about the economy and, and um, I, well, for me, the one one thing that kind of kickstart this economy again is consumption, and and we have people you know staying at home and and not able to get out there and work, and, and we're not we're saving more than than spending, um, and I say all that because I'm in North San Jose. Uh, I, I constantly point out the fact that uh, maybe not so much anymore, but uh, it used to be that that in North San Jose the business activity in our region uh, you know spurred funded seventy percent of the sales tax revenue for for our general fund. Um, and I, I know that staff, mayor's office, my office has done a lot of work um, in over the years to kind of convince Bloom uh, to move from Sunnyvale or, or to expand from Sunnyvale into North San Jose. Um, and as the mayor mentioned earlier today, doing the similar work with HPE, getting them to move from their headquarters from I think Palo Alto uh, to North San Jose and with news today that they're moving uh, their headquarters to Houston. Um, I, I'm concerned about you know uh, the market moving it away from San Jose. Um, I know that the the HP site will still be open with with employees, so they're not uh, vacating the site. Uh, but for us to bring Bloom Energy uh, to San Jose and, and to um, basically not welcome their their product uh, is is concern to me. Now, clearly that in and of itself is not a, not a good enough reason to allow for an exemption if they have a product that is, is dirty or uh, is not uh, in line with the vision that we have. Um, I, I would agree with Councilman Perales's uh, general point, but we, we know that and even Bloom knows that uh, there are other technologies out there and they're working on that. Um, they It's been mentioned about their hydrogen fuel cell uh, it's not just an idea or a pipe dream. I think they they even won a competitive bid to to get that in. I think it was Changwon, uh, South Korea, right? To to provide 100% to hydrogen powered uh, solid oxide fuel cells and electrolytes, uh, electrolyzers uh, to do that. So they're they're working on that technology, and I think it's incumbent upon us, you know, uh, this council, City of San Jose, Capital of the Silicon Valley, to allow these innovative companies the, the space uh, to to build that bridge to the future. Um, I, I think Bloom Energy, and I won't speak uh, for them, we have representatives here, but you know, based on the fact that they're moving towards hydrogen, I, I feel that they understand that uh, their natural gas fuel cells are not uh, their business model. And that's probably gonna change in the future. Um, and, and so also as the, you know, the person who's, who's gotten the opportunity to deal with uh, a lot of the companies in North San Jose, I, I've been able to see some proprietary information that uh, I, I won't get into because I, I want to misstate it, uh, but I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future and what, what companies in North San Jose within our city boundaries are doing uh, in regard to climate change. And uh, their, their technologies that I, I've seen or that companies are working on to you know, deal with the carbon output and turn that carbon into something productive. Uh, that would actually fuel our economy and, and create more jobs uh, locally. So I, I know that we're all on the same page here, um, but I do think that to just close uh, the door for Bloom uh, fuel cell energy, uh, fuel cells uh, is not something that I'm comfortable with just so abruptly uh, without some sort of, uh, you know, window that, that staff has suggested, star, staff has carved out uh, so that we, we, can, we can do that. Um, so I, I, I'm going to you know, see where the vote goes. And hopefully, uh, Councilmember Davis uh, will get a chance to vote on Councilmember Davis's underlying motion. I, I would ask Councilmember Davis to also include the, the Future to Work workshop in that, that motion. Um, but th that's kind of where I'm, I'm at. Uh, before I, I close, I just want to commend the, um, the advocates who, who came out to, to speak and write. Every, time, you know, every now and then, we have these, uh, these issues where a lot of people turn out to speak or, or to bombard us with emails and, and uh, phone calls. And it's always the uh, environmental uh, groups that I enjoy reading the emails the most because uh, they're, um, 
they're polite and they're kind of delightful and they're science based and uh, they're always optimistic about the future and and they bring um, an energy from the younger generation out uh, to to convey the, the their passion and the immediacy of of this effort and this work and uh, I, I've always enjoyed that so so thank you for that and uh, I'll, I'll end here and we'll see where the boat goes. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank Councilmembers Perales and Diep for mentioning the Future of Work workshop. I had meant to include that in my original motion and uh, forgot before I hit mute and, and yielded the floor. So I do want to clarify that uh, should we get to the underlying motion that I made, I, I had every intention of including that Future of Work workshop in into the motion. All right, thank you, Councilmember. We'll we'll get to that if we uh, were able to. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, I have never had a subject that made my head explode as much as this one. I have spent so many hours trying to number one understand the issue from both sides uh, of of the issue and uh, listen to advocates on, on all side, advocates that I respect on, on both sides. And, but so I feel this is an issue that the data can be used to sell either side. And so I have to come down or I have to look at this in, a, in possibly a different way. Carrie, something you said to, first I wanna thank the members of the public who were here and particularly the students. The students, you are our future and the changes we are making today are because of you. And because I'm a mom, I take that very seriously. Your comments uh, brought tears to my eyes in, Kate, in many cases. I'm a very emotional mother as it is. And when I hear students advocate so strongly and so passionately, it makes me take notice. Carrie, something you said also made me take notice and it goes along with the, what the students were saying. You said that the, if we adopt the underlying motion, you didn't quite put it this way, but that's how I'm gonna put it, is that we will get to meet our climate goals but it will take us 10 years longer to do that. How, how are we going to do that? If, if we don't ban gas now and we don't, and we allow the exemptions included in the, your subsequent memos, including the reliance on natural gas for the uh, microgrids or the um, fuel cells, how are we going to get there in 10 years? Thank you, council member. Um, I was not referring to it would take us 10 years longer um, be because of allowing this, um, this enhanced exemption. But what I, what I meant was we would have um, a little bit more emission than we would have without the exemption. But at the end of 10 years, we would be in the same place because ideally those natural gas fuel cells would uh, no longer be in operation using natural gas. So, um, so instead of having a, a drop, um, we would kind of have a little bit less steep of a drop and then eventually get back to the same point in, in 2030. Um, but all of the research indicates that the next 10 years are incredibly important to the future of our planet. And so um, moving quickly in, on all fronts uh, becomes very important. And, now it's really what I hear from our environmental groups is um, they view this as a little bit of a pullback. I, I view it as a, a little bit of a step back in terms of our uh, aggressiveness on uh, banning natural gas, but that, that step back allows us to move forward more quickly on densification, which has other um, enhanced and steep benefits to our climate plan. So, um, so from my perspective, you know, I'm trying to walk that place in the middle that um, from a policy standpoint um, is not personally rewarding because sort of everyone's mad at you, but, um, but generally kind of trying to, to compromise on both ends to, to make forward progress. 
Carrie, I hear you. I feel that everyone's going to be mad at me at the end of the day today, too. Um, so you said something else um, just now uh, about the uh, the fuel cells being convert being able to be converted from natural gas to hydrogen or clean uh, uh, clean energy. But the question I have is. What guarantees do we have that those businesses that are relying on the fuel cells are actually going to make that transition? Isn't it going to be costly for them to do so? And if the fuel cells will will last up to 10 years, why would they do that in a bit? Why would they make that business decision to make that change? So um, my understanding is, um, you know, in, in the, uh, the fuel cells need to be sort of replenished after five years. They typically have a lifespan of five to seven. So changing the fuel um, input is, um, is effort, but um, not uh, heroic effort, not very significant effort. But my, um, my hope is that as the stability of the grid improves and gets to where, frankly, it needs to be, that um, there would not be a need for these products. So that's why we're requiring that the facility be connected to the grid because then when there's sort of less angst about uh, seven day power shutdown, then you wouldn't need that asset anymore. So I'm less concerned about conversion. Conversion would be great for battery pack backup for hospitals and for others. But, um, but again, I don't know how expensive that would be. Okay. So, but again, so I never, as I said to someone else today, I never thought the iPhone would take off so fast. So <laughs> in terms of innovation, I might not be the most assertive in that. <laughs> I, I also want to talk about hydrogen a little bit. There, there's been uh, talk about hydrogen being uh, clean energy, but it isn't necessarily. My understanding, and I'm no expert, but I've done my research and talked to more people than I can care to consider about hydrogen. And hydrogen can be just as dirty or dirtier than uh, any other type of fuel, uh, or it can be very clean. So there's no guarantee that the hydrogen that is available is uh, green hydrogen, right? I mean, how do we make that? How do we require that? And so, Philly, Dr. Brower apparently is now back on the line, who I think is an expert in that. Do you want to hear from him or I, I'm uh, sure <laughs> I am I'm just trying okay, to understand the availability, how we're going to get it yeah. and, and then how the city's going to enforce it. But uh, sure, Dr. Are, Brower, are, thank you. These are terrific questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Foley. Um, I also um, want to say that um, it's not just uh, Bloom Energy you're talking about here. There are um, several. I would say maybe tens of companies that make this technology that can both make hydrogen and convert hydrogen to electricity. And let me just mention that um, there are means by which several jurisdictions have um, assured and created a framework in which we make sure we eliminate the fossil eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions associated with hydrogen production and at the same time use those very technologies, these electrolyzers, which can be powered off of sun and wind power, um, assure that these can enable more and more sun and wind power to be used. This is, this is the um, synergistic relationship <laughs> between the renewable electricity and the renewable fuels that we need in the future to achieve very high, and I'm talking about 100% high, renewable energy in society. If, if we don't do both of these things, because it's easy to get 50% renewables, 60% renewables on the grid, it's very difficult to get 80% and even more difficult to get 100% without something like renewable hydrogen. No other solution do people know about. No other researcher in the world has a known solution to get to really high 
renewable content. If you want only 50%, sure, you can just do batteries and fuel, do batteries and solar and wind. You don't need fuels. You can, you can do anything with natural gas to complement that. It's fine. The, I would say the bold and the um, seriously sustainable solution involves both decarbonizing all fuels and decarbonizing grid. Um, and at the same time, making sure that it's zero criteria pollutant emissions. And this is, this is the way in which we evolve what we currently do with natural gas. And again, I'm not a fan of natural gas. Natural gas has to be eliminated eventually. But what we do is we take these technologies that can do both criteria pollutant emission reduction and greenhouse gas emission reductions and enable super high, I'm talking about 100% renewable on the electric grid. And that's what hydrogen will enable us to do. And, and okay, eventually, okay, let me, let me just mention a couple of things. Many jurisdictions around the world, including um, almost every European country, Japan, um, Australia, um, many other jur jurisdictions have looked at this problem and they initially didn't think maybe hydrogen and fuel cells would be required, but now they have committed to investing billions of dollars. Germany alone, 9 billion. France, another 8 billion euros on hydrogen alone because it engenders high, super high, 100% renewable on the electric grid, while at the same time enabling zero emissions in things like ships and planes and trains and long haul trucks. It enables seasonal storage of the renewables. And there's not another solution that anyone in science knows about today that can do those very things. And it's not just Bloom Energy Technology, it's a whole bunch of other companies that can participate in this market to enable the city of San Jose, okay, to become a world leader in transforming the grid instead of getting rid of it, the gas grid. Transforming gas infrastructure to support the renewable vision. Right, Th thank you, I, I appreciate that. Uh, how, uh, you don't have any skin in the game, professor, other than you're a researcher and you uh, are an expert in this. Um, tell me how far away realistically are we from hydro from clean hydrogen? So zero emissions, renewable hydrogen will be available and cheaper than the fossil al alternative within five years. And how expensive, if you if you know this, how expensive will it be for a company who uh, relies on fuel cells to convert to hydrogen? So it's expensive today, but because of these international commitments that will be investing in this technology that's very high on the learning curve, okay, still very high on the learning curve, I believe that these companies will be able to transform their current investment in fuel cells, electrolyzers, hydrogen, and natural gas equipment to hydrogen equipment um, it will be very cost effective. There will be a need, um, as I think Council Member, Council Member uh, Romanow was stating, to replace the stacks. Okay, these are fuel cell stacks, okay? These are individual cells that are stacked one on top of each other. They have to re be replaced every five to 10 years anyway. This is kind of like a major overhaul of a power plant or a major overhaul of any kind of piece of equipment. And these um, equipment um, major overhaul events can be also transformative with regard to the fuel input. Okay, so what you can do is when the fuel cell stacks need to be replaced, you can actually transform them into handling more hydrogen, handling more renewables, and eventually handling 100% renewables in the end. Okay. And this is, this is like a, a seamless transition from my perspective because the stack replacement is a, is a known quantity. Okay, 
Thank you. We're, we're really, I appreciate that. That's uh, good information and I'll watch for hydrogen to come. But right now we're talking about a ban on uh, natural gas. Yes. So I'd like to um, uh, move over to Chris Burton and ask him some questions about development, if I could. Chris, you, you still with me? Chris, you had mentioned that development is slowing down, but isn't it slowing down because of the economics of COVID as much as anything else? Have you heard from developers that they're ready to submit applications or that they're going to buy up a piece of property that they're going to tear down and rebuild uh, and they're not going to do it because we're converting to uh, all electric? No, or is it more yeah. a COVID economic situation? Yeah, COVID economics for sure. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because I, I assumed that was the case, but when the statement is made that developers aren't coming here, it's really not necessarily that all electric buildings. Uh, in, in fact, they may not want to build all electric buildings, but it's there are other reasons that are slowing them down at, at this particular time. But you would also, and I didn't realize this in the, the original memo, that there is, if a building is being renovated, it's exempt from the electrification and say, and, and then when there's also the hardship exemption, if they could want to apply for that. That's correct. The, the ordinance applies to new construction. So development. Okay. That would make sense then. Rehab is not new. Thank you. Um, regarding the exemption, where, how, where and how, what's the process for someone to apply for the hardship exemption? Right, and Rosalind, so- Rosalind, is that, that correct? Okay. No, that, that's definitely the, the Lisa and Rosalind show. So through the, the building permit process, they take care of that stuff. Do yeah. we, uh, so this is a new thing. Do you have a process in place or an idea of how long it might take or what kind of uh, conditions uh, someone would have to meet in order to obtain a hardship exemption? Thank you, council members. So as Lisa Joyner mentioned previously, uh, the building division does currently process exemptions for um, ADA compliance. Um, as well as our new ADU amnesty program. And so the division does have some experience in, in processing these exemption requests. And so we will be using, you know, those similar processes um, as we take on this new work. You're right, this is going to be new. So we'll be working very closely uh, with Ken and others in ESD as the city receives these requests. So it isn't something that a uh, builder would have to wait like December when we do general plan amendments to submit their application. They could submit the hardship exemption request as needed, as they're ready. That's correct. Yeah, okay. it would be part of the building plan review process. And, and in this case, it would actually be at the beginning of the plan review process as opposed to the end like our other hardship applications. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the debate and the conversation. As I said, this is a really complicated issue that uh, literally my head has exploded. And I will share with you that I do not uh, go to bed at night. I'm not someone who has difficulty going to sleep or even thinks about the issues uh, when I'm sleeping that keeps me awake. But this issue has kept, hasn't kept me awake, but I have literally had dreams about this four nights in a row as to what's in the best interest of our city and our future. And at the end, I'm a mother and mama bear is gonna come out. And I really believe that protecting our environment for our children, for my children, for my grandchildren, for your children and grandchildren, for the teenagers who are still possibly on the call is really the most important thing for me. So that is the number one thing that will be driving my decision. I also wanted to share with you that I truly believe in going green. 
We have one vehicle between the, my husband and I. It's an all electric vehicle and we have 21 solar panels that generate 7,000 kilowatts of power. So I, I walk the talk as much as I possibly can, but I need to do more as a policymaker. So I'm going with that, I'm going to finish, uh, conclude my comments and listen to the rest of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Thank you. Um, I think by now a lot of my questions have been answered. So I want to thank my uh, colleagues for asking some really great questions. Um, one of which was, you know, how far we are, are we from the clean hydrogen? And um, it sounds like uh, from Council Member Foley's questions, just recent questions, uh, we have about a five year timeline, which coincides with the lifespan of a fuel cell which is what we're primarily talking about today, but um, this refers to any distributed energy resources. So it could be solar panels, it could be wind turbines, correct, Carrie? Uh, no, Ken, is, is there a more clear definition that we've provided in the, in the text of the memo? The, uh, the, the definition on the distributed energy resources uh, within the body of uh, the actual ordinance document, uh, it does contain that um, the state uh, standard uh, in terms of uh, emissions that uh, several of you have mentioned earlier. So it's in the, in the body of the ordinance, uh, not necessarily in the memo? Uh, correct, yeah. But it doesn't include solar panels. So it does not include solar panels. Is that okay. correct, Ken? That's correct, yeah. So, so it doesn't need an exemption. <laughs> right. Well, we wouldn't we wouldn't want yeah. an exemption from right. them. Right. So yeah. right now we're just talking about fuel cells. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, one one of the questions that I didn't hear my um, colleagues ask, and I know this was I think in the first um, memo, and that is that uh, the the um, our San Jose clean energy would be impacted um, and our uh, business model would be impacted. Um, I think we would have, there was uh, some implications that we would have a loss. What, what exactly would that mean for us if we pass the underlying motion? Um, Zach, you wanna take that? Sure, um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Zach Strike, Assistant Director of Community Energy. Um, you know, electricity that is being delivered to a customer by Bloom Energy is electricity that San Jose Clean Energy is not um, selling them. So uh, that's a reduction in revenue uh, for us. How much depends on the deployment. And as discussed earlier, we don't seem to have a good read on that um, yet. Okay, so we're not really sure about what that impact would be because we don't know who's in the pipeline. We don't know who's going to construct or... Um, within these next three years fast enough to to be able to take advantage of this exemption um so that's kind of all up in the air um and i think rosalind you were asked this question already and, and i don't think you i think you said that you couldn't really tell us who's in the pipeline like who would benefit from 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 this exemption or how many not who but how many projects would benefit from these this exemption yeah, thank you, Councilmember. Yeah, so I'm sure there are, there are applicants and developers out there who would benefit from such an exemption, but just hard to give you a firm number at this point. Yeah, okay. Um, it, you know, I agree with Councilmember Perales uh, in his original, um, I mean, his original, his earlier comments. Um, uh, the, he stated, you know, we don't have as much information. I feel like we needed to have a study session on this item alone um, to figure out, you know, we, we, had, we had to have a bit of a mini uh, study session to figure out what distributed energy resources were, right? Um, and uh, and so, so anyway, so we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants here in terms of a group, but I think collectively we've learned so much from each other. We learned from some of the um, experts who've come um, and express some, some, um, some of their wisdom with us. And I think uh, Professor, Oh my gosh, I can't remember his name, but the professor who just recently talked also um, shared with us his, uh, his uh, I, I think his thoughts about transforming the gas infrastructure to renewable. 
and he said that that was about five years away. And so, and he sounded really excited <laughs> about all this. I'm sure, you know, as as uh, as somebody in his field, this is cutting edge. This is something that's on the brink, and and it and is very very exciting to them, and and it is to me as well. It's just. Um, <laughs> It's just I think I would have benefited from a from a study session ahead of time. But you know we are we are making the decisions based on on studying these these issues and what um, what the policies really mean for our communities. And so my community did uh, get really impacted by PSPS shutdowns. Um, and you know I have a a community that that um, that is older. <laughs> And we have a lot of senior assisted living facilities. And so I'm very uh, sensitive to that. Now I wanna make sure that those kinds of uh, folks um, have um, a consistent source of energy. And hopefully in, in five years time, we'll have, uh, uh, we'll definitely have a mass production of green hydrogen, uh, which at this point we know is not going to happen. Um, so my question is, if we know that uh, green uh, hydrogen is, isn't what's going to be uh, transmitted through those pipeline, through the pipes um, um, and this ban infrastructure, the natural gas infrastructure really is to, allow, to continue to allow gas. Um, it, it, this, this piece to me really worries me. Um, and I think the professor also talked about, about how, how uh, we, we could get potentially in the future some, some uh, uh, gas with, with, um, with some re renewable, um, I think he called it electrolyzers uh, with sun and wind. Um, and so anyways, there's a lot of potential for the future. I just think right now we're, we're staring at um, continuing with natural gas. And that for me is a, um, is something that, um, weighs heavy, uh, on me. And, uh, and I think about, you know, our, the future of our generations and where we're going to stand with, with something like this. Um, and, and how to balance the development of the city of San Jose with the needs of our future generations. Like, so how do we balance all of this? And so that's uh, part of what I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out for myself, try to figure out where I'm at with this. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I thought about was, well, because we know that green uh, 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 fuel can't, or at least hydrogen can't come through those pipes right now, um, I thought, well, if if the underlying motion, if this the the present motion on the floor doesn't come through, and the underlying motion, we get to the underlying motion, I thought about, well, how about if there is a fee that gets imposed um, uh, to those folks who will default to a fuel cell? Now I know that it's hard to figure this piece out because from what um, we've talked about, this is not connected to a meter, it's behind the meter. So it's not something that we quantify, correct, Gary? Um, I don't think we know, we would be able to know exactly how much they use, but I don't think that would be hard um, to figure out. Got it. Well, one of the concerns that I ha heard loud and clear from uh, the environmental advocates was what's to keep uh, these folks from using the fuel cells 24-7, right? Uh, which from what you said, Carrie, is, um, I think you you said it was uh, a, a four and a half uh, a, a dirtier or emits, um, um, and I think it was a roundabout math um, uh, uh, formula that you used. And so, so I was wondering how could we prevent the fuel cells from being used as a default. And so, I don't council member, they are operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So they are now operated uh, ongoing. The, the ones who are grandfathered in. 
every right. every fuel cell what it doesn't it's not um able to be off and on it's on right. it's always it's always on so they will always default to a fuel cell um because i thought i had read that uh the fuel cells are are um uh, used as backup no they're used to avoid interruption so so it, it you could um avoid the need for backup power because the fuel cell provides continuous power. Okay, now that, that makes sense. Okay, okay, so I, I see why, um, okay, so I think this is something that the environmentalists um, were sharing with us and, uh, and uh, I'm glad that you cleared that up. Um, and so I appreciate that. Um, let me look for my... Is there is there a possibility for us to impose a fee for those folks who continue to use a, a, a fuel cell? Um, in this um, uh, gas ban exemption, I know they're exempted, but could we also uh, employ a, a fee an impact fee. I'm going to ask the city attorney for a little help on that. Um, is it possible for us to um, charge additional fees to facilities that want to use a fuel cell, um, sort of a, a carbon tax in a different way? Thank you for that question, Carrie. Um, and I'll uh, have Colleen back me up on this also, but we've already raised some concerns about whether or not that um, would be a tax that would cause um, some issues if it didn't go to the voters, if, if there was a uh, um, Prop 218 or Prop 26 problem. Um, Colleen, did you have anything to add? No, council member, actually, it's a really good question, but I think in you have, anytime you say fee or, you know, impose a fee on any kind of a, any kind of operation, you have to look at Proposition 26 and 218 in order to evaluate under what circumstances that that fee would appropriately be charged or applied. So if that were council's uh, direction that you wanted to come back and look at that, that would be something we would need to come back and look at and analyze in within a framework um, as opposed to simply trying to um, adopt it at this point. Sure, sure. I mean, and one would say that the cost of these fuel cells um, is, is maybe a penalty uh, in and of itself. Um, from what I understand, they're very expensive. Um, uh, but, but this is in, in an effort to discourage um, uh, the continuation of, of fuel cells, which is what we ultimately all want. Um, you know, those are the questions I had. I think most of the questions that uh, that were asked, are, I've already have already been answered for me. Um, I'm glad to see that in the underlying motion we have um, the future of work workshop um, included in there. So I appreciate that. Um, and I think for me, th those are the questions that I that I had. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Perales. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I had a, a comment and maybe a question for Jacob Brower. Um, I don't know if he's still on, is he? Uh, Dr. Brower? Henry's working on it. I, uh, I see him there. Okay. Yep. Yes, yes, I'm still on. I'm still on. Can you hear Great. me? Okay. Yes, thank you. So I had a, a, a comment and then, and then a question for you. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like you were talking about the ability to convert the infrastructure that we have now, for instance, to, to host hydrogen gas. Um, from what we, we got in the responses and, and even Carrie kind of confirmed it, that the current infrastructure that we have right now actually wouldn't be a good host as, as pipe and um, because of obviously a number of, of issues that it has just aging infrastructure leaks. But one that I've come to understand uh, in regards to just, just what the pipe can actually hold. And, um, and I guess my understanding is that the, the current 
pipe that we have as it's set up for natural gas um, would not be the, the right kind of pipe for hydrogen gas um, just in the way that it's it's manufactured, I guess. Um, and so could you speak to that? You, you didn't mention that within your comment. Yes, um, and let me also um, uh, <laughs> address a comment that uh, council member uh, Arenas uh, made with regard to five years being the time frame. The five years was the time frame. Um, I don't, I don't doc, doctor, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but if okay. you could stick to answering the question I asked, sure. I, 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 sorry, I, I know you may wanna respond to some of the things others have said and somebody may be happy to ask the question, but if, if you don't mind for now, just kind of responding to the question that I've asked. Then. Sorry about that, yes. So the current pipelines that are used in the distribution system, meaning those inside of buildings and in the low pressure part of the gas network can actually handle hydrogen very well. Um, the parts that are um, under, um, that are susceptible and um, have um, leakage and um, enhanced fatigue crack growth rate um, challenges, meaning hydrogen embrittlement. You may have heard of this uh, phenomenon before. These are actual physical phenomenon that affect pipeline longevity and leakage. Um, these are primarily in the transmission system. So there would have to be a very large transformation of the transmission system, but the pipes that we currently use in our homes and in buildings and such can very well over a period of hundreds of years or at least 100 years, okay, handle hydrogen. Thank, thank you for that. And, and I, I just wanted to, to throw the question over. If, I don't know if there's somebody from pg e or, or actually if Steve Flores is still on, on the call as well from, from the industry, because it's my understanding that I guess it's really the, the difference, and in my mind, this would include what's under our house, because the difference is from welded pipe to threaded pipe, and, and that uh, that's where the challenge is in actually switching over to, to fully hydrogen. So is, is there somebody from pg e that's, that's on that's able to answer that, or if not, if, if Steve Flores is still here from Local 393? And council member, that's my understanding as well, that the, the way the pipes are connected would differ because of the molecule size. And so um, that would assume if it would be 100% hydrogen, but I don't know that that's necessarily what folks are alluding to, uh, to the direction the market would take. Appreciate that. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody that was able to jump on. Um, I'm gonna look at the list and see who's still here. Yeah, I see Steve, Steve, Steve Flores with his hand up. Also Daniel Cedeno from pg e is on. Great, uh, I'll take either one first. Can, can you guys hear me now, this is Steve Flores. Yes, yes. Mr. Flores, we can hear yes. you. Okay, good, my microphone wasn't working good earlier. So the, the inf we're talking complete infrastructure. I wanna, what's your question? The, the existing inf infrastructure for pg e can that handle hydrogen? The infrastructure in your house, uh, in a new building, it depends on what you're talking about. It, you yeah, it would be hydrogen gas and threaded pipe. It would, be I guess it would be it'd be both. Doctor, it's what sounded like Dr. Brower said that the infrastructure we have maybe in our homes would be able to handle it, uh, but maybe not say for instance pg and e's oh, infrastructure. So I'm yeah. curious on both if you can answer the question for our, yeah. with, with on homes. I mean, it depends on in the house where it's where it's threaded. No, under the ground, outside where it's welded, maybe. You you can't use hydrogen pipe on, you can't use hydrogen gas in in, in threaded pipe. It, the molecule is too small. It's not it's not going to stay in, in the threaded pipe. Okay, thank you. That 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 is sufficient for Wherever me. Whatever you have a threaded pipe, you can't use it. Thank you. I I appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, that that's sufficient for me. I don't know if um. Daniel wanted to chime in from pg &E. Council member, this is uh, Daniel. Um, I can follow up to get you uh, more specifics and any other council members that have specific questions relating to pg and uh, uh, system uh, for our service territory. Um, I think though, in hearing a lot of the comments in the discussion tonight, I, what I wanted to just sort of reiterate is that um, pg and &E is supporting limiting the expansion of the existing 
gas system because we don't want to have underutilized assets later on down the road. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where our focus has been on this, but we do welcome the conversation more um, because we do see um, things such as hydrogen and such being increasingly discussed in the energy space moving forward. So it's something we're definitely looking at as well too. Okay, thanks. And I, I think I got the answer I was looking for and thank you, Carrie, for, for chiming in. It does sound like there, there's maybe even more nuanced differences as, as we dive deeper into this in the conversation today. And I'll, I'll just end, I, I know Councilmember Rodena has mentioned in regards to maybe something to disincentivize a, a, an additional um, fee of sorts that doesn't sound like it's possible, but I, I'd say there's nothing more of a disincentive than, than the motion that I have on the table that still indeed allows um, uh, an opportunity for a hardship exemption or even the limited exemption for the next couple years. Um, in my mind, that's the best disincentive. I think Carrie spoke to it well in regards to how quickly we may be getting to where we want to go. Um, and in one sense, my motion gets us there much quicker. It disincentivizes the use of natural gas uh, much quicker. Uh, it still allows for an opportunity for those that may qualify for a hardship exemption uh, or the limited exemptions for the next couple of years. So I, I think it, I think that is the, the balance um, if you're siding with, I think what, what is truly important again, which is the, the impact we're having for our future generations um, and no amount of fee or dollar amount, I think could match up to, to, to the impacts that we are having on our environment. And so I, I think, you know, it's a bold, move uh, that staff version came out with and, and that's why I hope my colleagues can can support the, the motion that's currently on the table. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm not inclined to support it. I'd like to understand a bit more. Um, and, you know, I know Councilman Perales, you indicated it'd be an inconvenience to folks about whether or not they could actually qualify for a, a hardship exemption uh, but the reality is it's an uncertainty. That's more than an inconvenience. And I guess I'd ask Chris, Chris Burton, are you with us still? <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Chris. Um, if, if a particular industrial user uh, hospital or data center or whatever um, critically believes they need to have a fuel cell and doesn't know whether or not they'll actually get a permit to use one, <laughs> And to be able to deploy one, um, how does that affect affect investment decisions for folks who decide they want to actually move forward here or some alternative location? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's exactly the point, Mayor. Is they'll always consider an alternative location if the costs are similar and the uncertainty is removed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think to the extent that it's something that we've adopted and surrounding municipalities have not, then there's a good chance that we'll see that development go to. Here go. Um, Councilman Crosco, if you could perhaps mute your, uh, oh, your sorry. Question. Thank you. And that, that gives me some pause. And, um, maybe Zach, could you tell us roughly how many commercial customers you have now in San Jose Clean Energy? I'm sorry, Zach, you're uh, muted right now. Apologies. Um, uh, approximately 25,000. 25,000 commercial customers citywide. Yes. Okay. And so we think we have something roughly on the order of magnitude of 20 bloom boxes now in the city. So that's presumably less than one tenth of 1% of our commercial customers citywide. And that's after the company's been in operation for more than a decade. Is that right? I'm not arguing with your math. No, sir. Okay. I, I know there's been some talk about how this might affect San Jose Clean Energy, but it seems to me this is um, probably less than a rounding error. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's our largest, our largest customer is a, is a, a Bloom customer. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, it's, it, it is the big ones, but, um, but um, to date, it is uh, manageable. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I know that there's some question that, Councilmember Foley, I think, rightly raised about whether or not hydrogen's really ready now. And I, I think it's important we just concede that point. I don't think anyone's claiming it is. And that's an important question she raised. I think what I heard, though, from Dr. Browser quite critically is that this is something that can be ready. 
Um, and we really, really, really need to find some pathways to an emission-free, resilient, reliable energy supply in the future for those folks who are super sensitive to the to grid interruption. Um, and so I, I know, um, you know, there, there were some questions about whether or not, you know, the fuel cells are just about natural gas. And I, I don't know if Carl Gordino is still on the line or somebody can answer if this is, is, is Bloom a natural gas company? Um, Carl, if you're still with us. I see your hands raised. I'm not sure if you're able to speak. Mayor, Mayor Licardo and Council, yes, I'm still with you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Uh, sir, thank you for the question. No, we are not a natural gas company. We are a technology company that is agnostic on the molecules. We already can operate with natural gas, as you've mentioned, with biogas, with biomass from your landfills, et cetera, et cetera with uh, hydrogen, as you've mentioned, clean hydrogen, as we are shipping to South Korea uh, um, this month, as you know, from, uh, as I believe you all know, from what we have publicly stated in partnership with South Korea. Uh, so one, we are not a fossil fuel company, we're a technology company, and 19 patents on hydrogen. Uh, that is really where we started as a company uh, um, when we started the company 19 years ago to make sure uh, that, uh, th that the market conditions also have to be there uh, for hydrogen or any other type of source of the electrons. I, I would also mention on the resiliency side, because I think this is really important. The August blackouts, as you know, one out of five residents in your city one out of five, 200,000 plus, we're without power for almost two days. We often partner at Bloom with our friends in solar and wind. Uh, batteries currently last about four hours. And as members of your team have let you know, when the CPUC and PG&E acknowledge that it is going to be years where it's only going to get worse in duration and intensity, duration for your citizens, as well as your businesses who employ San Jose residents is critical that we have that resiliency. And we shouldn't take that for granted because when the option is dirty diesel generators that are already operating in Santa Clara County, not for 3.5 days a year, but as much as 33 days a year, 800 hours a year, are the only option that we have that is not an option because those are often placed near schools and in our most disadvantaged communities. And the evidence from EPA and others is increasingly clear that that is worse than smoking. It leads to preterm health issues, dementia. It is viewed as the biggest health challenge in the United States. And when people question whether or not uh, we are eliminating those localized air pollutants, we don't have combustion. That's why it's 99.9% .9 free of particulate matter 2.5, which sticks in your lungs permanently, especially susceptible, sus susceptible to children, seniors, asthmatics, and athletes, but all of us, 99.9% .9 removal of PM10, of NOx and of SOx, and the option that we would be leaving people with resiliency is more and more dirty diesel generators that CPUC and PUC have said is our destiny. That cannot be our destiny for the city of San Jose. We can do better than that because it is the neighborhoods that we all are, are living in in San Jose that I was raised in that are most impacted whether it's people Thanks. in an assisted living center or somewhere else. So this vote is very important that the motion on the floor from council member Davis seconded by council member Lundy. Carl, I'm sorry, I think you're pretty far beyond the scope of the question here. Sorry Thank to cut you, you off. Sir. I just wanna make sure we're 
we're all staying on track here. Um, so, uh, you know, my concern is, is that we're, we're simply not providing the bridge we need to get to an emission-free, resilient future. Um, and I think you probably heard a few of the reasons why that's disconcerting from in Carl's answer, but I've articulated several as well. Um, and leaving a lot of users who critically need that grid resiliency with an uncertainty about whether or not they'll be able to get it is uh, simply a way of saying, welcome to Sunnyvale, <laughs> welcome to some other city, uh, enjoy yourself um, because you're not gonna be doing business here. Um, and we're gonna miss those employers um, when the unemployment rate continues to climb in the months ahead. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanna start out also by thanking all of the um, the advocates who uh, I've met with and who've come out and spoke, as well as uh, all the emails that I received. Uh, I also wanna thank um, Carl and uh, some of the members of the Bloom team for providing me their perspective. Uh, I particularly wanna focus in on you, Carrie, because you've been on the forefront of our Climate Smart Initiative and you're the you're the the hub of the spoke of all of our efforts. Everything that we've done so far, you've been a, a driver of that. You're passionate about this initiative. You're committed to the outcomes and results. And I don't want you to have to totally repeat yourself, but can you just briefly kind of walk me through your decision making process in terms of creating the exemptions? Because I know that. You, did not, you would not take that decision lightly. I know that you gave it a lot of thought. And so can you just reiterate some of the, the rationale behind that decision and your thought process? Thank you, Vice Mayor Jones. I really appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to, um, to share a little bit about the, the process that the team and I went through. Um, you know, again, there's, it, Climate Smart is intentionally flexible and it's intentionally adaptable. Um, you know, when you look at the graphic of Climate Smart, it's kind of a windy path to get to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, and so we're looking at trade-offs to protect the environment, to protect our, um, our residents, and, um, and economic development is a part of that. So when we look to transition to a renewable future and, um, and densifying, um, you know, the, the term the mayor used is kind of creating that bridge. And that was part, definitely part of part of our thought process is how do we achieve all of the objectives? How do we um, not sort of take one action that in um, it takes another one off path? And so we want the trajectory of everything to be going in the right direction. So by making this concession um, and allowing a little bit more natural gas than we honestly prefer. Um, to improve the densification and uh, and provide economic um, prosperity to all of our community through job creation and through getting people out of their vehicles, um, we thought that that concession um, made sense. But our intent is to um, fully transition to a renewable um, future, which means we fully intend to not have any natural gas in our city. That's not going to happen in the next five years. Probably not going to happen in the next ten years. But that is our intent. Um, but it's the, the pace at which we make that change needs to take into account um, the pace that our um, businesses can handle, the pace that our community can handle, and frankly, the pace that our environment can handle. And when I see the tension between the, the environmental community and, uh, and the business community, um, and, and like I said, I'm right in the middle of it, I feel like that's probably a good spot. Uh, next question is, if we allow the exemption, what impact will that have on our ultimate, uh, reach our ultimate goal of our client smart uh, initiative? We'll reach our climate smart goal. So we'll have to make some transitions in the short term, but in the long term, um, it won't have a material impact. But there, in my opinion, there will be a material impact if the densification is delayed. So, um, we should never, you know, take necessarily take uh, staff's recommendations as gospel. But 
you're again, you're the expert in this in this area. You've been in the trenches with all the initiatives that we've had so far, and you've gotten us to where we are now. And so I have to take your recommendations. I, I give them a, a, a lot of credence because I respect what you've done so far. I, I respect where you've taken the city. And I also respect the amount of due diligence and thought that you put behind your recommendations. So I have not, I've, I've heard a lot of good questions and my colleagues have raised a lot of good points, but I have not heard um, a point that was made that would make me say, okay, I am not gonna go along with or accept Carrie's recommendation because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, I, I really think that you, um, you made the case and uh, I'm gonna support your recommendation as, as, as well as supporting the underlying motion. But again, I wanna thank everybody who's come out and participated and regardless of whether we incorporate exemptions or not, this is a, this is a win for, for the city. It's a win for the environmental community. And, and we can't lose sight of that. We have to understand what we, where we've been, what we've accomplished so far and where we're going and consider this a, a success regardless of whether we incorporate the exemptions or not. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just want to um, reiterate that Climate Smart San Jose is a team sport. So there's Ken and Zach and Rosalind and Lisa and Chris and Colleen and just the sheer number of departments kind of helps us shape those uh, those recommendations. Okay, I'll share the love, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you to everybody else on the team. <laughs> okay, the love shared. Uh, Councilman Carrasco. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and and I also I, I want to thank you also Carrie and your whole entire team. This this is this is not an easy issue, but but many of the issues that we deal with on on any given Tuesday are not easy. I think this one is particularly difficult because we're all thinking of uh, as as Councilmember Foley had expressed earlier today, we're thinking of the future of our children, and and if we believe science. And I believe that we have an extremely intelligent council and an extremely intelligent uh, staff uh, in the city. Uh, and we believe in science, the era of not believing in science is over. Uh, but, uh, but we believe in it. We, we believe that we're in, in, uh, in on, you know, crunch time and that everything that we do from here on out um, is going to impact us one way or the other. Either we're we're uh, going to uh, save Mother Earth, and in turn uh, have a future for our children, or we're down um, a horrible um, demise, and and with with no. Ms. Mark Carrasco, I think we just lost your connection. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Council Member Camus, unless she connects right away, and we'll come right back to her when she's able to reconnect. Council Member Camus. Thank you, Mayor, and I'm sorry, I think I had my hand up uh, and then um, I literally lost power <laughs> from the battery dying on the computer. I. I um, it wasn't a great problem, though. <laughs> well, I did lose uh, I, I did lose connection earlier today, so I'm having a lot of uh, connectivity issues at my household today. Um, but you know, but I'm a big believer in in being uh, leading by example, and I, I appreciate the you know the work that we've done for from from mayor to mayor. Quite frankly, this this has been a goal. You know, we a green. I think mayor. Chuck Reed had a different name for it, green footprint or whatever it was. We, we, we've always been concerned about our, uh, how we treat our earth and, um, and, and we've always led, led by example at the city of San Jose. I, I too, in my own personal life, uh, like I said, I, I uh, confess to you that I bought solar recently and um, uh, for my house and uh, bought another electric car now that one of my children is driving. 
Um, and so, so we are leading and, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, and, and, and what I want to say is, you know, whether it's preserving, you know, thousands of acres from being developed in South Coyote or, or all the other programs on uh, construction development and, and, and uh, eliminating gas, um, I, I've supported all of them. I am having trouble with this one because, you know, uh, it, it, it does uh, cost a whole lot uh, for big, big construction projects. Uh, we, we, we could look back to Adobe. They testified on this issue a while back and they said it cost them 15% more to build. And, and, and quite frankly, not every company has deep pockets to come to San Jose. So that's a consideration for companies to San Jose. Some companies absolutely need uninterrupted power sources. And uh, obviously PG&E is not the answer. And uh, other than, you know, putting in diesel or, or whatever else, um, you know, uh, we need to have some options open. And so I don't believe that, um, you know, the current, you know, I don't believe that not doing anything is, is the right answer, but I would rather you know, measure twice and, and cut once. You know, I don't want to make a mistake that drives away our economic, uh, the potential for our economic growth. And I don't want to be known that on any given Tuesday, the city council can actually hinder, uh, you know, the, the, the business community. And, and, and unfortunately, I, th I think we are starting to build that reputation. But uh, I, I want to be clear, I, I, I do support our environmental goals quite clearly with, with, with votes and personal action but I but I am um, I'm hesitant to support the underlying mo the, the current motion on the floor and I, I will be supporting the motion from uh, council member Davis if if it does come up only because I, I want to have a clear message and I'm not sold um, on on that it won't do any harm and so my whole fear is do no harm um, and 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 um, at least wait until this technology gets de developed and provide very few exemptions that could help us keep businesses uh, from from at least locating elsewhere, and that's that's where my thinking is. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, other comments before we vote? Okay, the motion before us is Councilmember Perales's motion. Does anybody need it to be restated or clarified before a vote? Okay, let's vote on Councilmember Perales's motion. Yes. Yes. Perales. Aye. Yep. Nay. Carrasco. Let's vote on Councilmember Perales's motion. Carrasco. I'm sorry. What are we voting on? Um, Councilmember Perales's motion. Which one? Councilmember Perales's motion. Okay. I I did want to say a couple of things. I don't know if it's too late at this point. Uh, we started voting. Okay. Uh, so this is Councilmember Perales. Aye. Davis? No. Esparza? No. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Foley? No. Camus? No. Jones? No. Licardo? No. Thank you. All right, back to Council Member Davis. I know she indicated she wanted to make an amendment. Uh, Council Member Davis? Yes, thank you. I want to amend my original motion to include the Future of Work workshop that was um, discussed in the letter from the plumbers, steam fitters, and pipe fitters. And it talks about um, a Future of Work workshop with key stakeholders from labor, business, and the environmental community. To, um, to guide the implementation, but also to talk about a transition as we try to meet our city's energy goals. And there was some discussion about um, water efficiency goals and plumbing for that. And I would like uh, to include an exploration of that. It's worded, the letter is worded about requirements, but I'd like to include an explora exploration of that. Okay, just to put, uh, well, first, let me just ask if the seconder Whoever that yes. might be. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm okay. yeah. All right. He's okay with that. Uh, in terms of that last edition, would that be essentially maybe a some kind of workload assessment that could come back to rules from staff or? Yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Councilmember Foley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wonder, my concern with this motion all along was that it removed any type of sunset uh, as it related to uh, the fuel cell technology. Would uh, Council Member Davis consider including a sunset in her motion, uh, which was eliminated by the new language, uh, preferably 2023? I believe there is a sunset now under the. So we. Uh, I didn't read that. If it is there, I didn't read it with the new language that was submitted. It was. But it was the, confusing language. It was in the language for 1125. The 1125 supplemental memo included that. Um, coming back to council, I believe in 2023. Yeah, no later than uh, December 31st, 2023, to to basically reassess. Okay, so so you were moving just to clarify. Then you were moving the eleven twenty five memo, and then added the additional language. Is that correct? That's correct. Plus the um, attached ADU exemption from the eleven sixteen memo. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, you know I owe an apology to Councilmember Carrasco. Um, I remember now that she actually got cut off because her connection was lost. And then I think during the vote, she wanted to speak again. And I wasn't thinking about that fact. Councilman Cross, did you want to speak now? We still have motions well, on the board here. Thank you. It's a little, <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Well, it's a little late now. I was hoping to garner some support for, for our, our original uh, 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 motion. The, the one thing I, I do want to say, at least to be able to go on the record, is is uh, that you know the the motions now it's uh, Council Member Davis's motion that I, that we need to consider is whatever we do here in the city of San Jose because we are the largest city in the Bay Area and of course uh, the tenth largest in the country and we can't forget that the world is looking at us the country looks at us we lead by example. And so even though it may only be, you know, a very small number of uh, cells here, we set the example and, and it can have a rippling effect, a domino effect for the rest of the, of the Bay Area and for the rest of the country. My concern is that, that we, we leave a future for our children that may not be optimal and may be one that is in, in, in peril. And so uh, as we look at future technologies, I really do hope that that we are looking to see how we are uh, leaving a future that truly is a future for our children and that truly is one that um, is going to uh, uh, to ensure uh, the wellness and the safety of of everybody. And, and, and I want to say this because I think it's very important and Council Member Foley alluded to to our youth. Uh, I live on the east side of San Jose. I don't just represent them. I live with my neighbors who are being doused with lead by a very small airport and, uh, and have neighbors uh, from around the different districts who are refusing to close it down because it doesn't impact them. But I'll tell you that our kiddos are uh, being doused by lead, and we know what lead does to the cognitive and physical development of children. And so Council Member Arenas, Council Member Esparza, and I have, uh, have repeatedly made attempts to bring this uh, to the attention of the general public. It's very interesting when it doesn't affect you, uh, it doesn't interest you, uh, but this is uh, an environmental issue that impacts Everybody, I just need to be very clear about that. I also live in a district where our children suffer from incredibly high incidence of asthma. Um, and as a result, have incredibly high incidence of truancy, absenteeism. Again, it's an environmental issue. I am living in a district where we're missing a canopy we're at 25% of what Willow Glen gets to experience. And as I had expressed earlier during other council sessions, 
I started running again during the summer. It was very difficult to take up running on the east side of San Jose because there's very little shade. And you start to unravel this as you, you st- as you know, the boot, boots, boots hit the ground, as you, you start to run through the streets of the east side of San Jose. I found myself running more in Willow Glen because it was shaded almost entirely. And so, so these are environmental issues that have very direct impact on my residents. I'm living it. I'm raising three children. So I know what it means to have uh, very direct impact by uh, environmental issues that are not being addressed in a very direct way. This is a very, this is a huge concern for me because I know that at the end of the day, children of color are always left behind. So I wanna thank all of the, the individuals that came out to speak on this issue because it's important to hear those who are truly working uh, to make this a, a, not just a better world, but to be able to have something that we can speak of. And I've said this before, Mother Earth will survive. We'll have Mother Earth. She's been here for millions of years who won't survive will be us. And so uh, so as we make these decisions, I want us to think about that. And I understand that economic development is incredibly important and we have to make sure that San Jose is, is viable and it's vital and it's vibrant and it's, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's competitive. But I also wanna make sure that we do so smartly, intelligently, and we do so in a way that's going to ensure the future of our children but especially children of color who have really uh, felt the sting of, uh, of an environmental um, uh, injustice uh, for far too long. So with that, Mayor, thank you so much for allowing me now to say a few words. Um, I was hoping to have said it beforehand. I, I see where the votes went anyway, uh, but I wanna also thank Carrie and her team for having worked so hard on, on this uh, item. And what I was saying is this item is very difficult. It's very complicated. Uh, the, the ramifications are dire. Uh, unlike, they're not unlike other issues that we've dealt with on a, any given Tuesday, but, but this uh, you know, can, can have a very, very um, significant impact on, on whether or not we are able to rectify what we know is coming. And we've been given a very short timeline in terms of, uh, 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 straightening out this uh, this ship. And so I, I'm very concerned about where we're going. Um, I, I thought I, I knew where I was going when I met with Bloom. And once I did a little bit more research, uh, the concerns really surfaced for me. So I don't think that I'm going to be able to support this motion. I was hoping that, uh, that Council Member Perales' motion would have survived and I'm sorry that it didn't. But thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Spartan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, I, and I, first I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Carrasco for, um, for her really powerful words um, just now. I, I would love to see, um, you know, a shared passion around all the children in our Valley, including the children of the East side um, on some environmental issues there. Um, and so thank you, Council Member Carrasco. Um, and I, uh, I have some questions. So um, for Council Member Davis, so for the motion um, that's on the floor, um, the, uh, so that includes the, um, the future of work workshop with the date of March 31st, to hold the workshop. letter, yes, to so, hold the oh, so that includes the date. And so the water energy and water efficiency goals was part of that, and that got moved to a um, uh, another process. So can we then get the results um, of that staff uh, recommendation before the March thirty first, so that it could. Um, be included in March in the March 31st, excuse me, timeline. Can okay. staff meet that timeline? I think that's a question. It sounds like for, would that be for planning building or for city manager? 
I was imagining that multiple departments would yeah. would be involved in that workshop. Um, yeah, Carrie. Okay. So, so Dave, um, is this a question for Dave Sykes or? Yeah. Carrie, did you want so to? So then I'll just request it. How's that? So yeah. I will request that we get that process that that comes back in time for the March 31st meeting. Um, and would that be okay with the maker of the motion? I think that was your intent. It was my intent. And, and the what Carrie had asked for was to bring it back to to rules with a, um, a work, basically a workload estimate. And so generally when we make those those requests um, on the dais, they they come within a, a month or so. So I assumed that it would it would be well before the March thirty first. Great, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So that if that um, if that does move forward and get the green light, which I'm hoping it will, that could be included in that meeting. Um, and lastly, I just uh, wanted to ask another question, um, and I don't know if this is for Roslyn. Um, but for the future of work workshop um, with the key stakeholders, I represent one of the city's two industrial zones and have heard some concerns from the manufacturing community. Um, it, can we make sure that as we talk about business that we make a focus and uh, to include the manufacturing community and maybe that's a Chris Burton. We can do some outreach to make sure that they're included. I think that's an economic development question. <laughs> Yeah, council member, we can certainly um, certainly include them. We have a, a number of channels with which we regularly engage uh, our manufacturers, um, so we'll definitely do so. Great, thank you. That's it for me, Mayor. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna take a stab here at something Councilmember Foley had pointed out. Um, I certainly, I'm not inclined to, to support this motion, but if there's an opportunity to improve it and get things to move faster, um, I would be willing to. And Councilmember Foley mentioned that, uh, I, I think because she, she uh, wasn't aware of that the 2024 date in the, the November 25th um, supplemental, that she was looking at 2023 as a hard stop. And, um, and so that is at least one year sooner than the uh, the, the current motion that we have on the table. And so it was, and, and just to confirm Councilmember Foley, I, that I have interpreted uh, what you stated correctly. That's correct. Thank you. Great. So I, I would agree with that. Um, and again, I, I, I would prefer maybe just a uh, seeing where the, where the, you know, kind of cards are on the table uh, to, to vote no on this item, but I, I'd be willing to, vote yes if, if we can get a friendly amendment uh, to include what Councilmember Foley had asked for, which would be a hard stop in 2023 versus 2024. So the direction right now, Councilmember Perales, is for staff to come back and help us reevaluate uh, whether or not to make the stop at that time. And I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not inclined to change to making that that Dis determination right now without the information of staff coming back with a new analysis. But is the default not 2024, correct, if we don't stipulate anything different? The default is December 31st, 2024, um, but the director will come back dis by December 31st of 2023 with an analysis of the availability of fuel substitutes for natural gas and whether or not to transition this section. Yeah, okay, so then I understood it correctly. So what I'm asking for is a one year quicker. So essentially the same thing that Councilmember Foley was indicating. Um, so the same thing would be done, but we would advance that work one year sooner on, on, on both accounts. Carrie, would you like to expound on how you chose those dates, please? Yeah, thank you. So. Um, in our in our conversations um, with uh, with Bloom Energy, it was reasonable to say, you know, if we made a decision December thirty first, twenty twenty three, it would be hard to then um, make it effective a week later. And so we thought it was reasonable to to allow a year transition. So um, so that made sense to us. 
Thank you. I'm going to stick with staff recommendation. Okay, that, that was it. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. Any other questions or comments? You know, I also appreciate the comments that Councilmember Carrasco made, and there's no question that um, uh, there is a deeply uneven and inequitable impact of of um, environmental degradation in our community. I think, I hope uh, that folks appreciate that this is not a one dimensional challenge that we're facing though. And the fact that right now the default choice is folks buying a lot of dirty diesel backup generators because there is no other viable resiliency option that will provide them anything more than four or six hours of backup power uh, assuming they want to go buy uh, batteries. The fact that that's the only other option, if in fact there's not a, a clear path to some alternative, means that there's a lot of particulate emissions, a lot of nitrous oxide and uh, sulfur oxide that's getting released, I would assume, from those same generators. Uh, I'm not an expert. I don't know all the pollutants, but uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the CARB standard wouldn't allow those kinds of backup generators um, if, if we were to apply that standard to those generators. Problem is, it's not applied. That's not the standard. And you've got, in fact, data centers in Santa Clara that are buying you know 100 megawatts of dirty diesel backup generators. So when the ISO says, hey, guess what? We're, we're peaking out. You got to go use your generators and get off the grid. All of those generators are charging up and pumping a lot of, a lot of soot into the air. That we're breathing, um, those are, you know, those are the decisions that are being made throughout the city if people don't have options. And so I think it is important for us to recognize this is multidimensional. It's challenging. It's an optimization problem. It's not simply a um, a one-dimensional uh, issue. And and I'm confident uh, that we're taking a huge step here that is going to get us much much closer to our climate goals. Uh, and the important thing is that we will be moving entirely forward rather than taking step forward and step back every time we learn of the unintended consequences of not thinking about all the options and ensuring that we have a clear bridge. So anyway, I just want to say thanks again to staff for their incredibly hard work. I know there's been a lot of departments in this effort. I think we should be really proud, no matter what passes today, of what we've done uh, as the largest city in the country uh, to move toward electrification and new construction and I think uh, this is a, a great day for us. All right, let's vote on uh, Councilmember Davis's motion. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? No. Yep. Aye. Roscoe? No. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? No. Hamas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I have managed to lose my place, <laughs> but I believe uh, we're past 6.1. Are we on to 7.1 already? <laughs> That's correct, Mayor. Well, okay, great. So this is our college readiness. Um, I believe our library's team is here. And I don't know if there is a presentation on this item. It looks like there is, Mayor. Yes, there's a presentation on this okay, item. Great. Thank you, Dave. It's Henry. Um, so welcome to our library team. I, I think Jill's out today. Um, who may be speaking for Jill? Hi, right. Michelle Ornott, Deputy Director of the Welcome Library. Up. Adrian McBride will be providing the presentation this evening. Oh, great. Thank you. Hi. Welcome, Adrian. Hi, how are you? All right. Um, let me go ahead and I'm just going to share my screen and we can get started. Okay, thanks. Okay, 
So as Michelle mentioned, my name's Adrian McBride. Um, I'm the Community Programs Administrator. That's not backing up for you. I'm hearing an echo, but hopefully you're not. You're not, no. Okay, good. Sounds fine here. All right, great. Um, I'm a Community Programs Administrator, or yeah, Administrator with the San Jose Public Library. Um, I work uh, in College and Career Readiness. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, the College and Career Readiness Standards were born out of Council's approval of the Education and Digital Literacy Strategy on May 7th of 2018. Uh, since that time, the San Jose Public Library has developed um, standards around early education, extended learning, digital literacy, and uh, these standards that are here before you today, the College and Career Readiness Standards. Um, as part of this process, uh, the library convened an ad hoc committee uh, that was a cross-section of education and career development leaders from uh, the groups listed. Um, a little bit of context for you. Uh, the one at the, the top left, the San Jose CalSOAP, that stands for uh, California uh, Student Opportunity and Access Program out of uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, they do a lot of work at um, Overfelt High School and uh, other schools in the area. Um, for the ad hoc committee, the board met four times from May to June of 2020. Um, as a side note, we did begin the work about a week after the city shut down for COVID. Uh, so we do wanna appreciate um, all the partners who um, adjusted their schedule uh, to accommodate all the changes we had to make for COVID while they were doing their work at the same time. Um, so the college and career readiness standards, uh, they were modeled off of the digital literacy quality standards that were approved last year, um, including these eight subsections. Um, technology and access, and this included both um, internet access and device access, uh, privacy and security. Um, as a side note, um, you know, a, a strong portion of the ad hoc committee is from an education background as well as from the library in the city. So there was a very strong emphasis on privacy and ensuring that we um, adhere to the city of San Jose's privacy uh, policy and principles. Um, the third quality standard is safe and supportive uh, learning environments. Um, with COVID, obviously there was an increased focus on online learning in this section as we work through these standards. Uh, four was skill building and learning. This is to ensure the programs uh, stay current with um, modern technology and modern needs um, and solicit feedback from participants, um, both within the workshops as well as any um, professional advisors they may work with. Uh, five, curriculum and teaching practice. Um, you know, ensure the curriculum is aligned with the needs of participants. Uh, six is staffing, um, including training and professional development. Seven, uh, program management and leadership um, to ensure continuous improvement. And eight, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, this included focus on non-native English speakers, um, culturally relevant programming, as well as uh, programming that was responsive to the needs of uh, students who were differently abled. And I think one thing that was interesting as we went through this was sort of uh, the correlation between that last group, um, as well as ensuring that they had uh, the technology and the devices that they needed to participate in the programming. Um, as we build out these standards, we place them on a quality continuum. Um, beginning, emerging, and advanced. Um, you know, as we evaluate the, the programs, um, we just look at them. Are they beginning? Are they emerging? Are they advanced? Um, the purpose of the standards is to guide continuous improvement in college and career programming. So um, we looked for clear expectations. I think I jumped this slide. Yep, sorry about that. Um, the first of the standards are to guide continuous improvement in college and career programming. So we look for clear, expert, uh, clear expectations, um, both aspirational and tangible goals, um, as well as uh, uh, program assessments that will begin um, within the year. So that's our goal is to, once we get these approved, then we'll start uh, working on year one implementation. Uh, for the year one implementation, uh, we're going to conduct an environmental scan of existing programs for baseline data um, and then the begin planning for the year two implementation, which would be the development of a quality standards tool. But the year one would be the, the piloting the full impl implementation through San Jose Aspires. Um, that's a program that affects that impacts around 725 students 
Um, and then we can use that to create the assessment model that would we would begin using for the year two and the additional um, evaluations of other programs. Um, so uh, the recommendations, um, accept the staff report on the development of college and career readiness standards um, and adopt the proposed college and career readiness quality standards for all city programs. Um, and then I'm here as well as Michelle and Vidya and um, other representatives, if you have any questions. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for the pre presentation. Um, and thank you to you and, and Michelle and, and Jill and Lauren Hancock and Lizzie Nolan and Carla Alvarez and all the folks who have been um, leading this work. Um, also want to thank uh, from Work to Future, Monique Melkor. Um, oh, I realize my camera's not on, sorry. Uh, as well as uh, from PRNS, Israel Kanhura, um, and all the members of the ad hoc committee and the library and education commissioners who served on that committee. Uh, I know this has been, this is the final of four chapters um, in uh, the department's efforts to really flesh out our standards for education citywide and the transformation, and I think, of this department is something uh, more expansive and and even more impactful. And I think it's really been impressive to see how it's, um, how that's been embraced by everybody in, in the library team and, and across the other teams as well. Um, though the library isn't lead, but certainly from PRNS and, and Work to Future and others. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we're gonna be able to talk, I think very soon about the launch of the uh, Aspires, San Jose Aspires program uh, with some generous support of um, a couple of philanthropists uh, in particular that are really enabling us to provide greater access to college for low-income students um, in two of our high schools, and we hope many more soon, uh, and actually three of our schools, I guess, include one of the classes. And, and uh, you know, I just think there's a lot of exciting opportunities ahead now that we're really oriented as an organization in this direction. So I just want to say thank you uh, for all the hard work. Uh, we're going to go to the public and see if there are any public comments. I do not see anyone raising, oh, I'm sorry, my browser is not very cooperative, but I don't believe I see anyone raising their hand. Uh, the gentleman with the phone number ending 5140, oh, you just took your hand down. Okay, all right, I'll move on unless, sir, 5140, did you want to speak on this item? Your hand's up again. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. How do you know it was me? I mean, that's amazing. Anyway, glad you're so clairvoyant, Sam. Uh, you know, I'm happy that people are going to be using the libraries to help people with uh, school and uh, be prepared to be able to find their way in life. I use the public libraries all the time. I don't think the merger with SGSU is that good, but uh, besides the point, I hope that the program works for people. And the main thing is that now with COVID and everything, the libraries are doing a great job with the resources they have. And at the same time, we don't have the transvestites reading books to the kids anymore, which I thought was disgusting, by the way. So we're speaking uh, about college and career readiness standards. Yeah, well, the well, the, that, it all it, it's it goes along with that because if you get rid of those kind of ridiculous programs, you can have more money for people who really need it to be prepared for college, right? Like you know, you don't need all those other stupid things. This is what you need to do. So you know, get rid of get rid of the uh, transvestite reading hour and put the resources towards. Okay. My Paris connection has been cut off. Okay. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you. Um, I also want to thank the library department and PRNS. I know uh, there's a lot of joint work that happens here. I know this, uh, though, primarily library that's in the lead um, on this. Um, this was an item that was discussed in NSC and um, and it's one of the most exciting things that we have, I think, in our city, um, because it's an investment 
for our future generations. And so for me, it's, it's something that's absolutely monumental. Um, and because it is, um, and, and I, I was sad, uh, Adrian, you didn't share that wonderful story. It was a really feel good story. Um, it is not a story, but it really is an experience that was shared during NSC about a mother who, um, before she was involved, and I forget the specific program, um, I apologize, but there was a there was a, a, a mom who was just very desperate and had uh, didn't have any other, you know, kind of at the end of a rope with her kiddo who was, I think, in high school. And um, and came in to uh, be involved in one of our programs. And she said, you know, I don't know how all the stars were aligned, but the, the stars were all aligned. And, uh, and she noticed a huge difference in her kiddo and uh, in, her, um, in the way that this kiddo was, was now uh, participating in school, the way he was functioning in home. It was just, it just made a huge difference. And that's, I think, ultimately what we look for. We look for this huge difference that we're gonna make in the lives of our next generation. Um, and so I wanted to, to share that, that um, experience because I know that I, um, during NSC, um, also expressed uh, the love for these programs, but also the, the need for us to have um, really key programmatic um, alignment with, with, our, um, with the different programs that are under the College and Readiness. And I know this is the quality standards, but this is very much connected to the quality standards in terms of what we've done for uh, early childhood. We've done it for uh, the middle uh, middle school kiddos, and now we're doing this for college and career readiness. And and for me, what's really important is to look at the relationship among the resources, um, the activities that we do, um, the resources that we have. And what we ultimately want in terms of changes and results. And I don't know that, that we have that aligned, but I, I, I did get an update from Anne Grabowski with, of course, Chief of Staff for Jill, which um, made me really um, happy uh, in that I, I believe that there's already a process in, uh, involved to, to start discussing that. Is that right, Michelle? I see you uh, nodding your head. Yes, that's that's right, Council Member. Wonderful, mm -hmm. and and this is really not not to take away from and you know I, I made this really clear the last time, I, and this is not to take away from all the successes that you've had because this is I know for all of us we look forward to uh, being invited to the graduations and the end results of all of the hard work that you've uh, um, done throughout the whole year we get to see the end results and that is the success of our children the success of our youth. And, um, and I know for me, what is important is to take a look at what is happening in our county um, and take a look at, uh, at some of the data that's coming from uh, like uh, Kids in Common uh, produces kind of a data snapshot for the Children's Bill of Rights. And they tell us, how are we kind of faring with, with our children and how are we faring under the Bill of Rights? And so for me, it was important for us to, to aim somewhere because I don't want parents to, to feel like they just had all the stars aligned and this was just the, you know their huge luck. I want us to be very strategic about how we carry out our programs. And, and one of the things that, that I just wanted to share with, um, with my um, colleagues is that in, in the Bill of Rights um, that uh, uh, states that children will have access to 21st century education and promote success in life and future careers and lifelong uh, learning that we all hope to do. Um, in the area of children who are ready for school, we only have 50% of children ready for school, 50% of children. And then there's, on top of that, there's a 38% point gap between white and Latino students. So there's an ethnic disparity there on top of that. And know, now knowing that, I want us to continue to, to, for this data to guide us. This is just one element from one of the Bill of Rights for our youth. Um, 
And so for me, it was just important to reiterate, not only for, um, to you, you know, you get it, but um, to our colleagues who are not part of a, a, the NSC committee, um, that we need to make sure now that we're coming into, we know that we're not going to have the same resources and we're not going to have the same funding, uh, you know, knock on wood, hopefully everything will, we, we can maintain what we have now. And so I think it's it's in our best interest to be strategic about the resources that we have. And not only because we wanna make the best use of them, but we also want to be strategic in what we're achieving. Like what is those changes in the results and what is it that we're targeting in the end with the continuum of, of uh, wonderful and dynamic programs that are involved under the library? Ultimately, what, what are we hoping to achieve? And I know that there, every program has its purpose. Um, every program has some wonderful re results. Um, but I, I, and I wanna remind you something that I shared with all of you um, in NSC from the Racing to Justice book is that fairness is not advanced um, by those who, who um, are situated differently as if they, as if they were the same. A policy that is neutral in design isn't necessarily neutral in effect, right? So we need to make sure we're not neutral in our design. We need to be strategic so that we can also be um, just as um, emphatic in, in the, our results. Um, and so with that, I just, I don't know that, that I wanna include anything really in our, in, uh, in a motion, but I'd like to move to approve this. Um, and with the understanding that you will um, come back uh, to NSC to, uh, to deliver some of those outcomes that you're going to work on and the alignment of the program goals and how this, you know, this broader framework uh, of strategic alignment of our programs will look like is something I'm really looking forward to. Um, so actually, you know, I'll add that to the motion. I'll uh, move to approve and include that in the motion. Second. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. In the um, interest of the, uh, given the hour, I'll be really brief. I um, I wanted to add my voice to Council Member Arenas's comments. We've had um, a very robust conversation in NSE, um, and I just wanted to echo her comments and say that I look forward to um, seeing the logic model and seeing the alignment so that we can see some movement um, in kids, particularly Latino kids. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, let's vote then. Sorry, I was having a hard time unmuting there. Jimenez? Yeah, yes. Perales? Yes. Yep. Ah. Yes, sorry, so you could make, only make a noise. That's all you needed. That was to say if you're here. <laughs> Carrasco? We need an affirmative noise. <laughs> yeah. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 8.1 uh, relates to grant agreements and extension on grants for multiple homeless programs. I don't believe we have a presentation here, do we? Good evening, Mayor. It's Reagan with the Housing Department. No presentation. Okay. Thanks, Reagan. Uh, we'll go to the public. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. You know, something's a little funky down there with the uh, when I call in. Seems a little bit odd. It always happens to me. I also don't get my two minutes, but hey, I'm not here to complain. Now, there needs to be no more homeless programs. We have enough already, and we have the more homeless shelters you build, the more grants you give, the more money you get, the more you get. And we're getting more and more and more daily. We don't need more homeless centers. We need, we need to you know, Hewlett Packard just left this town. You know, what's going to happen when, when all these companies start leaving? There's, you're going to, you're not going to have any, any money for, for anything. 
And what about the roads? The roads aren't fixed. Well, oh, we got to have a million dollars here, a million dollars there for homeless. Meanwhile, I drive on roads that are worse than a third world country in my, in my neighborhood. And you, you, Sam, personally told me you were going to pay them, right? That you guys had this plan. Whatever happened to that plan? But no, we need grants for the homeless. We need grants for our roads. We need grants for these microgrids that uh, have the terrible u- this terrible utility grid we're on. When you people want to go all, all electric, you guys are crazy and you know it. It's not going to work. And then you're worried about backup power on diesel. But, but by all means, have a grant for the homeless people. We don't need to give them any more money. We need to give them jobs and, and mental health counseling and everything else. But more grants for more shelters? Forget it. These guys are bums. They're just using they're using the taxpayer so they can live for free in, in the most expensive part of the country. It's not how is that fair to how, how is that fair to the residents here? It's not, and you know it. And I want to thank you for not cutting me off this time. Vote no on more homeless grants, please. Thank you. Uh, we'll return to the council, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I uh, wanted to just uh, thank staff for putting this together, um, and uh, and thank the mayor for his leadership for the All the Way Home campaign um, that this will be actually going to the county's veteran uh, rapid rehousing program where we have seen in our county a lot of um, gains made um, there and a lot to be proud of. And I uh, also wanted to just point out that case management is a huge need. You know, we talk about shelter, um, but that's how people rebuild their lives is through that support. And so it's really exciting to see this. So. Um, my understanding is that um, we need to separate the health trust. Is that correct? Or on this? That is so, correct, yes, at okay. least for me. Uh, okay. I, I do need to recuse myself from the health trust vote because my wife is an employee there. Thank you, Councilmember Sparza. Oh, uh, thank okay, you. So me. I'll make a motion to um, move forward on uh, all of the grants except the health trust and to separate that. Second. Thank you, Councilmember, and thank you, Councilmember Sparza, for your work for several years in launching and uh, operating the All the Way Home Initiative. Um, Councilmember Peralta. Oh, sorry, Mayor. That, I, I was just going oh, to yeah. state what I did. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments? All right, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is the uh, consent calendar for land use items. Don't we need to do the health trust vote? Now. Oh, I guess we do. You're right. Let's do the health trust vote. All right, we got another uh, item still on 8.1. Was that a motion? <laughs> it was to separate. I'll make a motion to um, to approve the health trust grant. Very well. And there was a second, I think, from Councilmember Reynes. Uh, Councilmember Pross is recused on this. Let's vote. Yes. Yes. Yep. Aye. Osco. Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, on to uh, the land use consent calendar. Move approval. Second. Second. Anyone would like to pull any items? Actually, I think there's only one item. All right, I don't see any hands in the public. All right, we'll come back. Uh, let's vote. Uh, Councilmember Sparza, you have your hand up, I assume, from the prior vote? Uh, that's from earlier. I'll lower okay. it. Menez? Yes. Corrales? Aye. Dip? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. 
Licardo. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, item 10.2 is a PD rezoning and, and PD permit on 907 North Capitol. Um, Rosalind, is there a presentation on this item? Yes, Mayor, I just have a very brief presentation. You have a form that includes, no, oh, there you go, you got it. Great. So the item before the council uh, this evening is a project that's located on the west side of North Capitol Avenue. And the site is surrounded by single family detached and attached homes. The project includes the demolition of an existing single family home and a two car garage, as well as a shed, um, as well as removal of uh, five ordinate sized trees for the construction of six new single family attached homes. The project also includes a common area pot parcel that contains the front landscaping, the private street trash area and six guest parking spaces. The project meets the provisions for CEQA guidelines for new construction of up to six units in an urban area. So it qualifies for a categorical exemption. It would not result in any significant environmental impact. The Planning Commission heard the project that is November 18th meeting and voted unanimously to recommend that the City Council consider the CEQA exemption, approve the plan development rezoning, adopt a resolution approving the tentative map, and adopt a resolution approving the plan development permit. And that concludes staff's. Thank you, uh, Rosalind. All right, let's go to members of the public to comment on this item 10.2 PD rezoning and permit at 907 North Capitol. I don't see any hands raised. So I'm going to go back to the council and ask council member. Yep. Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and move the motion. But uh, I just have one question for, for Rosalind. If I recall correctly, that's this is near a light rail, isn't it? That is correct. Yes. And uh, sorry, I've just realized my camera's off. Uh, it was in your light rail. Don't don't we have? Um, I'm I'm happy if the planning commission is happy. Everyone seems on board. There's there's no, nothing here to, to debate. But I'm just curious. Um, is it in your light? Isn't there a density requirement and and like units per acre and, and whatnot? Um, not a density requirement based on its location, uh, proximity to the light rail. But um, the project was evaluated. Of course, it complies with our general plan land use designation. Um, it's a PD zoning, so it's a customized zoning district and really this qualifies, it's really an infill um, urban development project. Okay, so if it's outside the, the density requirement near light rail, that's fine. All right, move to approve, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll second. There's a second from Councilmember Perales. Any other comments or questions? Okay, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're on to public forum. Would any members of the public like to speak on open forum? I'm not seeing, I see one hand. Uh, the gentleman with the phone number 5140. Yeah, I just, you know, I got a lot of complaints about this city and uh, I'm wondering why I'm the only one sometimes. Uh, do people not have the courage to call in and call people on the carpet for what they've done? what they failed to do in this city with the poor roads, bad, bad electrical grid, uh, graffiti everywhere, rusting brown light poles that look like they're going to fall over, uh, a police department that's rife with corruption. They've got felons that have been caught working for them, what, you know, ranging from gun running, drug trafficking, pedophilia, drug cover-ups, rape, uh, and I say gun running, 
you, you know, you, oh, oh, I forgot money laundering. Money laundering. You got, you got a guy who's got a pension and everything worth millions of dollars laundering money. Who, who are you people hiring your city? It's disgusting. It really is. Uh, you got transvestites reading books to kids in the in the library. Thank God the libraries are closed. And then you know, and then you've got politicians that are telling you not to have Thanksgiving, but they go and have it themselves. And uh, I think we know who we're talking about here. And that was that was rude, man. Like everyone else is trying to follow the rules and just the elitist attitude of the police department, the fire department, the city council, the mayor. It's unbelievable. The, and I'm watching the news here. It, it's it's never ending uh, follies for the city of San Jose, and you know, you know, I, I see the people in the city council. I see the looks on their face. And I hear what they say. Uh, I, I know what you guys are all about and how you hate people like me. You should. You should really hate people like me because I speak the truth. And and everybody who's in the city council, city. Em- Thank you. All right, uh, there seem to be no other members of the public would like to speak. So the meeting is adjourned, everybody stay healthy. Thank you.